much better than than speaking. I I, I was just on a webinar with the uh, IAPS committee in Israel, and uh, the the uh, the system went down, and I but I kept talking. I didn't know. So it <laughs> went about five minutes. <laughs> yeah, and that's it's disconcerting. It's too bad that this uh, they haven't come up with some way for the speaker to get some kind of of feedback because it is it is very strange to to do that in the blind like that right very slow today so Do you guys hear that email tone when I get an email like I just did? Yes. Yes. Yeah. So I don't know what to do about it. If I if I mute or turn the volume down, then I can't hear you. Uh, turn your email off. <laughs> I can do that. So Barry, uh, are we ready to rock and roll? Uh, yeah. We only have we only have, we have we have less than sixty people. Um, I may, uh, we 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 could do, and I'll make the announcements at the um, at the at the question and answer period, because I wanted everybody to hear them. Okay, so let's get started with the final day of AB Hug 2021. Uh, my name is Scott Schwieger of Combined Cycle Journal, and I'd like to welcome everyone back, and hope you're having a great experience. Uh, the I certainly recommend that everyone opens up their participants tab and their chat tab. Uh, that's where you can send in questions. And if you hover over your name in the participants tab, you can raise your hand and we can unmute you and you can join the discussion as well. Uh, so I'd like to hand it over to Barry Dooley for the day three remarks to get started. Barry. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Scott. Good morning. Uh, good morning to everybody in Australia and New Zealand. And uh, we're going to get started uh, straight away. I have a few announcements, but I'm going to wait until the uh, till the uh, question and answer period because because I wanted everybody to hear about how they can get the presentations and stuff. So um, if uh, Scott just goes to the next slide, we can just see our supporting organisations. And the next slide will show the um, show our sponsors. And again, thanks very much to them. We'll hear from them this morning. So, so today we have um, we have another five uh, technical presentations and three uh, sponsor presentations. And um, we're going to get moving uh, straight away. The first the first uh, presentation is by you, Ken, from uh, Synergy and. Uh, Jan, please, uh, please proceed if you're ready. <clears throat> yeah, thanks, Barry. Um, and thanks for the opportunity to share. So let me just share my screen. Can you see the, the slide? Yes, it's good. Perfect. And we, can, and we can hear you. It's it's good. Thank you. Hey, thanks, Barry. Um, my name is Yun Qian. Um, and I'm lead access engineer at Synergy. The topic of my presentation today uh, is flexible pricing improvements, which is both a challenge and an opportunity for many qualified positions in the world. Before I start, just a um, um, brief introduction to Synergy. The Synergy is Western Australia's largest electricity generator and retailer, supplying energy to 1.1 million residential and business customers. We are government owned and operate in a partially deregulated market. So Synergy supplies electricity to the Southwest interconnected 
system or Swiss, which has a daily peak around 2000 megawatt. Swiss was operated by IEMO, Australia Electricity Market Operator. So our generation portfolio, including um, power and gas fired power stations and renewable assets, uh, wind, solar, and also Synergy is constructing a 100 megawatt, 200 megawatt hour big battery. So why flexible operation? Um, the simple answer is market changes. While overall demand has remained relatively steady in the last five years, base load generation has decreased as new large scale wind and solar generation entered the market and the rooftop solar installations have also increased significantly. To give you a sense of the scale of solar in WA last year alone, customers installed 358 megawatt of power on their roof. So this is comparable to the output of quality power station, which generated 340 megawatt that I'm going to talk about today. The effect of both of the um, intermittent renewables and the customer demands on the network power demand is the so-called dark curve, as you can see on the right hand the figure. So Synergy's answer to the challenge of the, the dark curve is flexible operation. Um, Synergy's flexible operation program began in 2019 and focused on three targets. The first target is a low load operation below the design minimum load. And the second target, reducing startup time and fuel oil consumption from um, starting of the boiler ID fan to minimum stable load. And target three is enhancing network support capabilities, including um, frequency support, load rejection, spin reserve, and ramp up and down rates. The overall goal of the, um, these targets in, uh, of the flexible operation is to achieve these targets in the most cost effective way, giving the remaining life of the generation units. We also need to recognize the uh, flexible operation is bounded by following constraints. The first one is the equipment design safety limits. And this includes the thermal stress, pressure ratings, uh, control interlocks, etc. And also second one, equipment remaining life, mainly for boiler components and turbine rotors. And the third one, market demand, including frequency control, ramp up and up and down rates, two shifts operation. So the flexible operation should not have significant adverse effects on generators' safety, remaining life, and network capabilities. So let's have a closer look at the quality power station. So quality power station has a one 340 megawatt unit, which is the largest single unit in Swiss. Quality power station was commissioned in 1999 has five core meters of power risers, a wall fired um, PC boiler, supercritical boiler, and uh, two precious uh, steam turbine without a steam bypass. So, our first target is to reduce minimum load from um, design minimum load of 135 megawatt to 105 megawatt. We chose 105 megawatt because we can uh, still operate the unit in a similar configuration to design minimum load while maintaining core meters above their minimum countdown ratio. So we have developed a systematic approach to achieve low load operation. And this is flow diagram that takes us through the steps of this approach, starting from uh, collecting designed operational information, prepare a low load test procedure, conduct a risk assessment, prepare work, uh, pre uh, complete preparation work prior to test. And after low load tests, we did um, test results review, um, test report, and rectified mechanical and control issues, uh, optimize, optimize process parameters. And the last step, um, we submit 
uh, IMO network dot update. So as the first step, uh, getting the procedure right was crucial to ensure a successful outcome of the test. Um, the procedure we develop, developed includes uh, per, test the targets, equipment conditions, preparation work prior to test, risk and controls, expected major operating parameters, and also list of major parameters to be monitored. Uh, we also include a test stop criteria, design information, and also process curves. So we developed the test procedure using um, similar concepts to ask me uh, plant performances as the standard PTC 46. For example, uh, the um, stabilization time and test duration for this type of plant, but we double the test duration to four hours to ensure equipment stability in extended low load operation. We have also created a um, plant information test, test page to monitor over 80 major parameters with out of limits alerts. So once we got a procedure right, we need to make sure we we were prepared prior to the test. We did this by um, risk assessment workshop between test team and the stakeholders to identify short term and long term risks, and uh, obtain approval. We also did technical discussions to determine the operating conditions, including co-mere combinations, agreement on operational network requirements and also changes to uh, DCS logic and settings. And prior to test, we did a test briefing, job safety analysis, and test task sheet for operation team. Um, and ex except of the test task sheet is shown on right hand. And we also request additional on-site inspection for any uh, abnormalities. And also lastly, we uh, submit operational request for AMO permission to do the test. So we did two tests successfully in February and March this year with two core meals and uh, 30 Celsius and 20 Celsius degree ambient temperature respectively. Um, as identified in risk assessment, uh, two major risks are primary air temperature and flue gas temperature. So the test result indicated both power rise fuel temperatures and flue gas temperature after air heater with higher than minimum values. Flame was also stable and no major issues identified. As an example, of the, um, on the right hand, it shows the mean steam temperature change during the test. You can see the mean steam, mean steam temperature um, at a tertiary superheater outlet with below the design maximum working temperature. So while we achieved excellent results, there were some learnings along the way. We have identified some mechanic instrument and DCS issues. As the equipment in the process, we not designed for this load level. Another important um, outcome was the cognition of the low load fishing constraints as we identified as three constraints to be the conditions as part of data submission to IEMO. And we have put in place an action plan to address these issues, especially DCS issues, to enable low load of fishing and all the changes we captured as per our management of changes procedure. So our second target is uh, reduce startup time and fuel oil consumption. And this is our approach we, uh, we have taken. We start with uh, startup sequence and settings review. And this includes uh, the um, collecting of design startup curves and operation instructions. Then we uh, did the startup sequence critical path diagram and we generated actual startup chain. Then we compare the design and actual startups with key inputs from critical path diagram. We also had a workshop to identify potential improvement. And also the last step, we modified the DCS logic and settings. And here are some um, 
optimization examples we have done. We modified our power division logic. So we can bring forward the first power riser startup from 80 megawatt to 50 megawatt um, and reduce startup time and the risk of boiler trip. We reduce the um, auxiliary steam pressure heat pump from 4 megapascal to 3 megapascal. We are looking at an increasing call oil ratio during startup and eliminate uh, steam pressure and temperature drop during oil power transmission by increasing coal um, combustion. We also uh, developed a startup planning tool. And each of these modifications saved or expect to save tens of minutes startup time. We also look at the package solutions like a boiler um, online monitoring system and also turbine um, or upgrading the turbine stress uh, evaluator. However, um, this subject to cost benefit analysis. And this diagram shows the duration of each milestone of the cold start and the critical path before logical changes. So the red line uh, is the boiler drum temperature and the purple line is the turbine uh, placement temperature. So what we can see from this diagram is that the startup duration, we are affected by um, many factors in addition to exact boiler drum or turbine casing temperatures. And the factors in, include, but not limited to uh, equipment reliability during startup and operation consistency, network dispatch delay, etc. This is why we have also developed a planning tool as we mentioned before, for operation team to do better planning as well as improve, improving our operation consistency. We haven't got enough number of startups to show uh, how much time we reduced uh, after logic changes overall, but analysis of a few stats or effects of specific logic changes showed very positive result. For example, um, we reduced 15 minutes of start duration as well as, well as oil consumption by simply reducing auxiliary steam pressure set point. So our third target is um, uh, enhance the network support capabilities, including frequency support and the ramp up and down rate. As, uh, as you know, unit network capability is mainly determined by uh, process design characteristics from coal mirror boiler to turbine, which could be very costly uh, to modify any equipment. So to ensure cost effective outcomes, at this stage, we um, to help in focus on the control logic and settings change rather than mechanical and process change. The DCS logic changes are uh, focused on improving turbine control valve response, uh, feed forward control, and also um, better prediction of the power near and boiler inertia. So here are some examples of the um, logic changes we have completed. Enhance the six second spin reserve by limiting steam pressure coordinator or TPC corrections and calibrated the turbine governor response to load changes. Fit the forward control to uh, boil the frequency support and core fade over firing to compensate the pressure drop due to mirror and boiler inertia and fit the forward reheater damper temperature control. And the further logical changes um, include the cold mirror classifier, wing anchor change automation, steam extraction and fade water control, um, quick opening of a mean steam control valve pilot valve, and also increase of MCV mean steam control valve partial arc control above 65% load. Um, just as an example, this is um, on the right hand of the diagram shows the turbine partial arc control uh, principles. As you can see uh, from the diagram, the CV1 and the CV3 are fully open, and the CV2 is used for frequency control and load changes between 60% and 90%. And what we are looking at is uh, for both CV2 and CV4 to participate in frequency control about 60% load. 
And here are some results from the uh, the logic change support uh, to provide a better uh, network support. One is the benchmark five person load increase test before logic changes. And the other one is 7.5% uh, load increase test after logic changes. The logic changes are uh, involved in these two uh, comparison uh, overfiring, oil overfiring, and turbine pressure coordinator, the GPC, correction logic changes. So the green line uh, is the generator output. The purple line is the boiler um, demand set point. And the yellow line is the GPC correction. Um, during this 17 megawatt or 5% uh, bench test before logic changes, the generator output dropped uh, about 10 megawatts after step load um, after frequency injection. So this is basically 60% of the load increase wiped out by the uh, GPC corrections and it took us seven minutes to uh, reinstate. And after logic changes, um, for the 7.5 percent load increase, or 25 megawatt increase, uh, the GPC been blocked for three minutes. And we had also 250% uh, boiler overfiring. You can see the generator output dropped about nine megawatts or 36% of uh, load increase. And the load uh, reinstated in just two minutes. So this is a big improvement in frequency support capability. Um, we are also looking at other improvements um, to adapt our power stations to a new market demand. And this includes two shifts of provision, uh, including boiler and turbine heat conservation. We also look at the um, equipment layout procedure, the mini life assessment for boiler and turbine, um, flow accelerated corrosion uh, during low load operation, and also boiler drum maximum ramp up rate finite element analysis. So this is last slide, and uh, I'm happy to take any questions. Yeah. yeah. Bian, thank you very much uh, for a nice uh, presentation and completed in good time. So if Bob has any questions, we can go, th go through them. Uh, there are none now. Um, if anyone has any questions uh, for Jan, uh, raise your hand or put them in the chat. So uh, Jan, I, I, have a, um, I have a comment and a question. You probably you probably know what it is. Um, I, I was waiting for you to say something about the cycle chemistry, and it was on. Uh, there was a little bit on on the last uh, slide. It seems uh, you probably gathered you probably gathered from the previous day's to discussion that uh, for reducing startup time and layup procedures and FAC, um, you, you can use the new uh, process to monitor the corrosion products. Um, and see, and you can use that to improve your um, operation and um, and and your um, shutdown and startup processes. It's uh, it's quite a few years since I went to um, to to Collie, so I can't remember what the uh, what the feed water system is. Could could you could you just remind us whether it's um, all ferrous or mixed metallurgy? Yeah, I think you are right. Um, the, uh, the water chemistry is uh, also very important for um, both the low load operation and also for the layup and all these things. And we as we also identified one of the issues during low load test was uh, the spike of the oxygen level in the fed water to boiler. And uh, we are still investigating uh, the cause cause of this thing. Um, yeah, yeah, I mean, it's it's very important. Um, at this stage, we, we focused on the um, more on the control logics and also fifty five mechanical issues. But water chemistry definitely is um, is a concern for long term operation. Yes, good. And and what about the what about the metallurgy and the feed water, Jan? I, I can't remember. Can you can you tell us what that is? Is it is it um, all ferrous or is it mixed is the mixed mixed uh, mixed metallurgy? 
I can't remember. It, it doesn't matter if you can't, uh, if you can't remember. Yeah, I cannot remember this. Um, probably, yeah, uh, they need to check with uh, uh, the chemist, uh, plant chemist. Yeah. Okay, so so I I, I will uh, I will send you this new IAPS document that you can share because it it could it, in in all the all the things that you're doing here are exactly what we want to include. So thanks uh, thanks very much. I, yeah, thanks very much. All right, uh, no no questions yet. Barry. Okay, well we'll we'll move on. Jan, thanks very uh, thank you very much for a nice presentation and. Uh, we'll move on to the second presentation this morning with Sarah Van Gree from Rio Tinto. Rio Tinto. Uh, if if he's um, here and available. Hey, Betty, I'm, I'm there. Oh, Sarah Van, yes, good. Morning. Good morning. Uh, yeah, I got the access. Uh, Can you see my screen? Yes. Yes, it's good. Okay. Uh, good morning to all. Uh, I'm Saravanan Gri. I'm uh, area mechanical engineer in Yavan. That's in Queensland. And I'm going to present on uh, an incident that happened in 2014. That was uh, acoustic contamination in the water peat water. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge uh, David Addison. He was uh, involved in the incident investigation. I'd like to thank ALS team. Uh, they have David, Jerry, Callum, Nick, and Joe. They have been our regular uh, inspectors for boilers and HRST. I'd like to thank Barry and, uh, for his uh, FAC assessment in 2019. And uh, he has provided a couple of uh, technical articles uh, for preparing this presentation. Contents, uh, I'll go through a brief uh, overview of the process that happens in the refinery, and I'll describe the uh, incident that happened in 2014. Uh, we'll look at uh, the causes and some immediate impact, and uh, we'll look at the inspection and, and findings after the incident. Uh, I'll touch upon a couple of uh, water side uh, damage mechanisms relating to uh, deposit corrosion. Uh, we'll see some references and and then we'll finish off. So this flow chart gives an overview of the steam generation uh, and uh, distribution in the alumina refinery here. Uh, digestion area 240. Is the, is the major consumer of uh, steam from uh, steam generation, which is area 720. Uh, digestion indirectly supplies low pressure steam to evaporation here, uh, 350. And uh, the condensates return from digestion and, uh, and evaporation. Uh, there are other accessories like the coal, gas, and, and ash handling, uh, which are not which are not on the focus for this uh, presentation. So I'll explain the, the steam and condensate path here and in our refinery, we have got uh, three coal fired boilers. Uh, each of them has a, has a maximum capacity of 245 tons per hour of HP steam. Uh, mm -hmm. we, have a, we have a co-generation plant with uh, gas turbine and HRST. We mostly operate at, at base load. Uh, producing 150 to 170 megawatt power. And the HRST can produce HP steam of uh, 300 tons per hour. And uh, it can go up to 600 tons if it's uh, tucked fire. HRST also produces uh, MP steam. So the whole plant has been divided into stage one and two. Stage one has two boilers that was constructed in 2005. And the stage two has got a boiler and the cogent plant that was started in 2012. 
So we use uh, pressure letdown stations to convert HP to MP and, and low pressure steam. Uh, we use the deaerators uh, 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 for, for the MP steam. And uh, we have suit blowers that are operating from the pressure let down from the HP steam. We had a, uh, a demon plant that operates on uh, ion exchange process. It has got four trains. Each of them has a, has a maximum capacity of 55 and a half cubic meter per hour. Normally, uh, it, it operates at 40, 40 cubic meter per hour. And uh, around 90 to 95 percent of the condensate returns from digestion and evaporation, which are the main uh, steam consumers. So out of which 80% is from digestion and 10% is from evaporation and we have got some miscellaneous amounts from, from caustic cleaning. Uh, so the digestion condensate returns, it's capped at, uh, at 15 micro slug per centimeter for the conductivity, whereas the condensate returning from evaporation is capped at 23. If uh, if the conductivity goes out of spec, then they are diverted to a process water tank. Uh, this is a quick uh, for a brief overview of the incident that happened in 2014. Uh, it happened in March. The boiler one feed water conductivity went from 10 to 600. Uh, drastically, and in boiler 2, 3, and HRST feed water, the conductivity increased to over 4,000 microslug per centimeter. It was estimated that around 7 cubic meter of caustic, which had a concentration of around 50 gram per liter, was contaminated into feed water. Uh, the immediate reaction to these spikes was was not to stop the boilers and HRST, uh, but to continue to operate uh, with the reduced steam production and uh, maximized blow down and, and drainage. So it took around 14 hours for the feed water conductivity to turn to limits and uh, around 30 hours for the conductivity to, to return to limits from the boiler samples. And it's it's obvious that it was a, a big production loss uh, of alumina for I think more than one and a half days. So that that's the brief of uh, the incident that happened. This is the this is the flow diagram that explains uh, on the causes. Uh, Uh, I would like to highlight three three different controls that were lost and uh, that led to the incident. One was a uh, uh, NRV here. Uh, the other one was the failure of a conductivity meter, and the other one was the incorrect operation of uh, the valve. Uh, a low pressure uh, event happened because of the incorrect operation of the valve here. Uh, this is a valve that, that allows HP steam to be uh, converted to low, low pressure steam. It was uh, set to manual mode, and uh, this caused low pressure on this uh, low pressure steam header. And uh, it was noticed that the NRV on that line had, had failed, but it has not been noticed. And uh, this is a this this tank shown here is a is a slurry tank that contains caustic, and there was a backflow from this line, and it it went towards uh, the deaerator. There was a conductivity a meter on the on the return line, the condensate return line, which was also found to have uh, failed. So all these three controls. Uh, Lost and and then led that led to the condensate with the contaminated uh, feed water to return to the deaerators here. One of the immediate impacts that was noticed after the 
incident was the, the loss of HRST steam output by around 1.8 tons, which is almost equivalent to one uh, one day of uh, the production. Uh, this way, th this way the causes and an immediate impact. Uh, looking at looking at the causes uh, and uh, the subsequent investigation that happened, uh, it was identified that the layers of protection that helps any process plan to, to operate safely was was compromised, and a subsequent hazard and, and process safety reviews were were conducted, and uh, following actions were taken as a result of the reviews. One of them was to add interlocks that would close the flow control valves when there is a low pressure uh, scenario. The operating procedure of the steam header was modified to, uh, to avoid repetition of uh, the valve handling. The frequency of the calibration checks on the connectivity measurement devices were increased. A preventative maintenance program for connectivity down stations was established. And uh, the evaporation condensate return was made fully automatic. Additional conductivity probes on the boiler were added as an additional layer of protection. So these were these were the these were the modifications that were done immediately after the incident. This is a chemical analysis of the contamination uh, that happened. You can see that uh, the caustic had 23 grams per liter, then the aluminum oxide 24, iron oxide nil, and SiO2.22, and chloride. Uh, was 0.17. So this was where specifically uh, uh, thermal chemistry, uh, David Edison was consulted. And uh, looking at these contamination, it, it was identified that the following damage mechanisms could, could happen uh, due to the contamination incident. First one is the superheated tube uh, scale deposits uh, in the boilers. And uh, again, scale deposits in HRS to HP superheater and evaporator. Uh, under deposit corrosion due to the presence of chloride and uh, caustic stress contamination, uh, caustic stress corrosion. Uh, we'll see the following slides on, on what, what actually happened and uh, the subsequent inspection. Uh, boilers and HRST were shut down for uh, subsequent investigation and inspection. It was noticed that there was significant amount of magnetite that was found in HRSP uh, HP drum. And uh, then the samples from the superior tubes from boilers were taken. It was noticed that one of the boilers, uh, which is under three, had a high bore oxide thickness of 111 micrometer, and there was an indication of uh, uh, thermal degradation. The thickness increase was around 60 from, from the last time the sample was taken. And uh, while, while we took samples from different areas, all, all of them had the same thickness, which, uh, which almost showed that it's affected by that, that incident. But uh, the thickness has not increased after after that drastic increase that happened once. Uh, it was noticed that the magnetite was blocked in flash tank drain line. Uh, there were no concerns on the deep samples from HRSG superheater and evaporator, and also from the boiler water walls. So these were the major uh, findings from from the inspection that happened subsequent to the. Incident. Uh, this slide shows the superheated tube oxide thickness uh, comparison 
between the boiler two and three. As I said, boiler three was was affected worst compared to other boilers. Uh, you can see that the thickness is around 102 uh, for boiler three compared to boiler two at 39. And you can see here uh, the life of those samples. Uh, so you can see that boiler two samples life was around 85,000 hours, whereas for boiler three it was just around 27,000. And uh, the previous time when when the samples were taken from boiler three, the thickness measured was 39, which had increased to 102. Uh, there were no concerns on the oxide chemical composition or hardness. This slide shows the metallurgical uh, analysis of the boiler three tube. Uh, it was it was uh, it was understood that a minor or an intermediate thermal degradation had had happened uh, uh, because of uh, the incident. I would say that this is the worst impact from the coal contamination incident that it had it had initiated a thermal degradation. So this is the status as of uh, uh, 2021. Uh, we have we have not gone <clears throat> to a worst scenario from what was found previously. Uh, we had a, a cycle chemistry and FAC assessment in 2019 during our sea service. Uh, so following things are happening at the moment. We have taken tube samples in, in the current shutdown and are waiting for test results. Uh, based on the FAC assessment, uh, it was pointed out that the instrumentation for cycle chemistry monitoring is, is, is at 65 percent compared to the standards required by the PWS. Uh, the one of the recommendations from the assessment was to implement water chemistry monitoring for makeup water heater. Uh, it's a coincidence that a tube leak happened in 2018, but it was thought that it was relating to dissimilar better well. well uh, one of the recommendations is to is to prepare or and implement a procedure for monitoring total iron, uh, and also to monitor sodium on the condensate returning to the deaerators. Uh, even though we operate the plant for like 15 years, still we don't have an established chemistry manual, which is something a big uh, uh, task for us to do. And uh, the other recommendation was to increase the pH to 9.6 to 9.8 in boiler feed water, which is I think around 9.3 to 9.4 at the moment. Uh, the other recommendation was to reduce the conductivity to less than eight in the boiler feed water. So this is this is the status as of uh, today, and. Uh, I'll touch upon a couple of damage mechanisms that are related to this incident. So the slides following this one will be from technical articles and not, not from Yavan. This, this one, this slide shows an, a comparison of the oxide composition for a, for a tube at a different operating temperature. So you can see the change in the magnetite for tubes operating at, at less than 570 and to the one operating above 570. The first damage mechanism I'd like to uh, discuss is the hydrogen damage. So for hydrogen damage to happen, uh, it has to have uh, two conditions together. One is the presence of uh, the oxide and the other one is the environment which is acidic or alkaline, which should have been, which should have been happened from the carryovers. And uh, so these two conditions can lead to uh, the release of atomic hydrogen and can, uh, and can diffuse it to steel 
uh, react with ion carbides and, and release methane, then it produces molecular hydrogen at green boundaries and, and initiates micro fissures. So, subsequently, worldwide degradation happens due to depletion of carbon, and the prolonged activity of this can, can convert the micro fissures to a crack, which can be a, a failure uh, starting point. And it's it's expected that the the attack rate on hydrogen damage would be around 10 millimeter per year uh, within the months of contamination. So uh, I think this did not happen in in Yavan. This slide shows an example of uh, uh, micro fissures and and cracks uh, from uh, hydrogen damaged uh, uh, tube sample. Uh, this tube had a, a, an oxide thickness of uh, 350 micrometer. Uh, the damage mechanism of hydrogen is, is, is different from the caustic uh, gouging, which will be seen. This is a, a, a metallurgical analysis of uh, the hydrogen damage. The micro fissures and, and, and the micro cracks can be seen in this one. The next one is a is a quick uh, look at the caustic or uh, and and phosphate corrosion. So this happens from deposits from phosphate treatment or caustic ingress, uh, which which happen in in Yavan. Uh, so the the weak spots are the ones with with high heat flux, and especially the ones horizontal or slanted, and and the sodium hydroxide removes magnetite layer, which then weakens uh, the tube and uh, the sodium hydroxide reacts to release uh, atomic hydrogen. The subsequent steps are similar to the hydrogen damage we saw. Uh, the attack rate in this in this damage mechanism would be around two millimeter per year compared to 10 uh, we saw for the hydrogen damage. This slide shows uh, some examples of uh, tubes affected by cost, caustic gouging, and this one is for this one is from the phosphate corrosion. Uh, this one is from, from caustic. Uh, this crack is on H, HRST HP evaporator. This is another uh, slide showing caustic gouging. And the deposit. So this one is a is a zoom view of the gouging that happens in case of a caustic corrosion. So I would treat these are the important things to to learn. Uh, one is the understanding the layer of protection and the controls that are in place, and continue to monitor them that. Those controls are are performing their duties, uh, and, and and always monitor cycle chemistry. It can cause it can cause damages, as 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 we know, it's it's more than seventy percent worldwide that these cycle chemistries are are affecting failures. And always always try to achieve the online instrumentation that has been set in IAPWS and not just conduct cycle chemistry reviews but, but implement recommendations. So for this for this presentation I've taken reference from uh, from Barry he, uh, he shared with me a couple of articles and I've also referred to the failure investigation of pilot tubes from ASM uh, and also tube analysis from Babcock and uh, and uh, an, art, an article from National Board of Boiler and Pressure Research Inspectors. Uh, I think that's it for me. Uh, if you have any questions, you can ask me. Thanks. Uh, uh, Saruman, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. We have a, we have a few time uh, minutes for some questions and comments and. Um, uh, this uh, I don't see any right at the moment, uh, though, uh, Bob. 
So, no, I, no. I, sorry, man. I have a couple. I have just a couple of comments. Um, um, that um, it was a little, it was a little confusing because the 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 first talk part of the talk was about uh, caustic intrusion, and and then you covered um, hydrogen damage. Well, I'm, you know, I'm sure that you know that hydrogen damage and and the generation of hydrogen would not occur if there was un under deposit corrosion from caustic. So. Um, I, I assumed uh, that any mechanism that you had would have been related to caustic, and I know you included caustic gouging, but but they were just general discussions. So, was there any identification of the specific mechanism that you had? Uh, no. So these were just some for 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 discussion, but uh, it was not identified. So I I agree with you that the hydrogen damage is not not related. To to the yeah, you can. Uh, you, you, yeah, we can easily identify those for you. In fact, uh, afterwards, I'll send you. I'll send you a couple of papers so that that'll be able to identify them exactly for you. And the other, the other little thing that was a little bit um, uh, confusing when I look at your steam grown oxides um, on unit two and three, um, they weren't at high enough magnification, but it looked it looked Saravan as if they were just normal oggy oxide growth and exfoliation, um, and uh, you can compare them with the um, the oxide review. It looked to me as if the oggy index was between three and four, and they just looked like normal. Both of them just looked like normal um, oggy. They have because and and well, how can you tell that? Because they have hematite on the outside into on the outside surface. And so I don't think that there's been any any interaction with the chemistry, and we know very well from the science that steam grown oxides are not influenced by the chemistry. So if you send me if you send me those uh, uh, in detail, then I can look at them for you. But but that would be my observation, just looking at your slides. Okay, thanks. It was very it, it's very interesting, and so please look at the oxide review, and then you'll see. Um, You'll see that they they fit pretty well into the pattern. Okay, thanks. I think there's a couple of um, Bob. There's a, a question from. Yeah, there, there's some comments from the previous presentation, um, saying that the uh, system is all ferrous. Yeah. Uh, on OT treatment. We got and the uh, uh, and it has a tripole CPP, whatever that is. Yeah. Sounds like a, a, a tripole polisher. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, has anyone got any questions? Yeah, uh, there, there, yes. there is one for there is one uh, Bob for ah, for yeah yeah Shard Con in Genesis. Yeah, would you like to unmute? Yeah, I would, we, I would like to speak up on that. Is that conductivity okay. meter? It's, was it really a calibration issue? Because conductivity meter is the most reliable measurement where chemistry is concerned. So I was just wondering that we don't calibrate it generally. We just it, check it, it out. Not, it was not a calibration issue. It was it was actually not performing at all. So it, it had failed and. It had failed. Yeah, no, yes, that, yes, that, that, yes. that's understandable. Yeah. No, thank you. Thank you. Any others? No. Uh, good. Well, there may there may there may be a few come in, uh, Saravan, into the into the general discussion. Thanks very much for now. That was that was uh, very interesting. With a few, I think a few open questions for you. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. So, uh, yeah, so the next part, the next, um, the next part, just before we go into the, uh, into the sponsor, uh, uh, uh presentations, I, I just wanted to make a couple of announcements because there's, um, there's, um, there's a large number of people here now. So, um, we have, um, had a, uh, a very good, uh, uh, Set of technical presentations here, and we're typically getting approximately a, a hundred, a hundred and ten people uh, throughout throughout the morning. Um, we're um, we uh, um, wanted to let you know 
that the, um, the, the, the presentations and the uh, recordings um, are going to be available on the uh, on the website probably um, in about a week's time. And uh, if anybody doesn't want their presentation or their recording to be uh, on the on the website for use by the uh, participants, then please let us know. Please, please let uh, me know and uh, and copy. Um, uh, Heather and Rachel at uh, Mecca. Um, or, or, or otherwise, we'll assume that it's uh, it, it's okay with you. And I already announced yesterday that we're going to allow the the presenters about one week if they want to make any changes. Please also send those to me, um, it, and send us the final version if there are if there are any if there are any uh, changes. So, next year we are going to um, have a hopefully a live meeting. Um, at uh, in Brisbane at the convention center, and uh, that will be on the 15th to the 17th of November next year. Hopefully, that will be a live meeting. We look forward to seeing you. And of course, as as we put these together um, with the steering committee, we're always very interested in uh, continual improvement, um, uh, both uh, technically and organizationally. And so, if anybody has any suggestions or any comments, please let us uh, please let us know. And uh, we've already had I've already received uh, quite a number of uh, comments and requests for the papers that we've mentioned. So there seems to be a, a lot of interest. So um, they were the uh, few announcements that I wanted to make. And uh, I think now that we can go to uh, the first um, uh, sponsor presentation by Anodamine this morning, and uh, John, uh, John O'Rourke, are, are you there and ready? Yeah, good morning, Barry. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you fine. Thank you. Very good. I'll uh, try and share my screen. I'll apologise for no video. Unfortunately, I don't have the bandwidth to... Uh, present, share, and and talk. So uh, thanks to NBN. But uh, if you uh, bear with me, uh, is that visible up on your screen? Yes, it's fine, John. Excellent. All right. Well, good morning, and thank you if you're interested in anodamine, and thanks for the opportunity to present this morning, a very brief uh, uh, introduction to anodamine. Anodamine is a product that's been in the power market for well over a decade. Uh, the product was invented by Paul Hatting, who before Anodamine was a technical director of one of the major FA suppliers, filming Amine suppliers. And Anodamine is currently treating more than 40 power groups, more than 600 units, generating more than 200,000 uh, megawatts. Uh, we're also treating some 30,000 megawatts of mixed metallurgy, uh, including Mount Piper in New South Wales, who recently successfully converted to AVTO, while still maintaining less than one PPB of copper even in the presence of lots of legacy copper in the system. We're treating over 55 supercritical units, including Cogan Creek here in Australia. Um, now, as I'm sure you're aware, uh, the United Men formulation is proprietary. That's been very well publicised uh, for, for some time, and its formulation is a trade secret. So we can't reveal that. But what we can share with you is that uh, United Men is not an amine. And it is not a carboxylate. It is definitely not a carboxylate. It's a unique surface active organic compound that's in full compliance with IAPS guidelines. All necessary plant impact, safety, environmental and handling information is available and supplied to allow complete risk assessment. Um, and it's interesting, there's no impact on instruments. Um, it's been used now for in excess of 10 years and uh, there's been no reports of any any issues with uh, with impact on instruments. Um, one of the very important parts of anodamine, and it's uh, very unique in this regard, is it's essentially non-toxic. An LD50 of some 169,600 milligrams per kilogram um, renders it essentially non-toxic. There are no handling risks. It's not a DG. It will not add to site discharge restrictions, and it's totally safe to discharge, and is fully biodegradable. 
And NOTA means thermally stable. It's been tested up to 600 degrees C with no evidence of thermal degradation. There's been extensive monitoring through hot areas of plant, including reheaters. Uh, we did this at Cogan Creek, monitoring uh, increase in cationic conductivity and found no rise in conductivity as a consequence of dosing anodamine. It has no impact on product or uh, no impact by the product on system pH or conductivity. Um, that being said, and we'll discuss a little bit in a moment, the, uh, um, it will uh, release inorganics from the oxide film in terms of cycle uh, clearance uh, for a brief period when it's uh, first started. Um, it's able to protect all metallurgies, including iron copper. As I mentioned before, we've managed to convert Mount Piper Power Station to AVTO and maintain less than one PPB of copper and soluble iron since introducing anodamine, even in the presence of significant quantities of legacy copper um, in, the, in the boiler tubes and in the uh, superheaters. Um, it's interesting to note that uh, when uh, uh, Araring converted to uh, AVTO and, uh, and changed to all ferrous, they ran for eight months with up to 20 ppb of copper. It was legacy copper in the system. We've avoided that. We've also avoided a chemical clean due to cycle clearance and compaction of the oxide. They returned to service three weeks early and we were able to uh, take advantage of good, good prices on the, on the grid. Anoda means able to prevent pitting and propagation of SCC. EPRI has uh, uh, released a couple of reports in that regard. And whilst corrosion fatigue is regarded as a mechanical rather than a chemical process, anodamine has been shown to reduce corrosion fatigue by eliminating the corrosion product in the crack, thereby reducing the rate of propagation. In many instances, where in plants with a history of tube failures due to corrosion fatigue, these have been eliminated on the introduction of, of anodamine. Um, anodamine is able to provide single and two phase FAC protection, and we'll show you some pictures uh, a little bit later in the presentation is able to operate in the steam and the water zone. It has approximately a 60 to 40 distribution ratio between steam and water. Just talk a little bit about the, uh, the mode of protection and how it works. I mentioned before it was unique and one of the most unique characteristics is that it treats the metal rather than the water. Um, and, uh, um, sorry, just getting messages. Um, so the asset's the focus of the protection. Now it works in three stages where the product is drawn to the parent metal by a process known as the Seebeck effect. Stage one is achieved when the parent metal throughout the system is saturated. The anodamine continues to be attracted to the metal and starts to envelop the protective oxide. Um, during this process, the inorganics trapped in the oxide are displaced. This is uh, what's been termed cycle clearance. This can lead to a transient increase in cation conductivity but when it's complete, the conductivity will drop back to normal. Removing the inorganics reduces the DWD, and as the, the anodamine renders the oxide hydrophobic, the semi-protective oxide is incorporated, incorporated into the protective oxide in a denser, more protective coating with a reduced DWD, um, calling it an anodamine enhanced oxide. And I understand EPRI has either started or will start a study on this phenomenon. It's been reported many times, including at Piper, where it allowed them to cancel the planned chemical clean of Unit 1, and as I mentioned, get back into service three weeks earlier. Um, we've been talking about offline protection. Um, Anodamine was originally developed for offline protection. It's this, this demonstrated a capability of protecting plant during outages under either wet layups or dry. No other measures are required. For short layups of three months or less, wet layups are possible when they have reached full protection, stage three protection. For longer than this, dry lap is required, but no other message, uh, measures other than flash drying is required. Um, the protection afforded offline by anodamine and the flexibility and method of layup has important impact on return to service. Some interesting discussions over the last few days of the challenges in chemistry and oxide transport during run-ups. The demonstrated significant reduction in oxide transport due to offline protection has significant impact on the time taken to reach required steam quality. This has implications for duration of bypass operation when waiting for steam purity release for steam turbine warm-up, meaning you're producing megawatts sooner. 
with a very, very variable price and power in the marketplace, this can mean that you're better able to capitalise on high prices. Um, the slide you're showing at the moment is uh, from our European brothers who uh, um, in a uh, 435 megawatt CCGT uh, introduced an odomene and within four, sorry, five weeks had a 51% reduction in oxide transport and 85% after 10 weeks. They calculated that the gas saving on the cold starts was about $90,000. And that's with European gas prices. I think our gas prices are worse, so the saving could conceivably be more. So warm start, comparable warm start, reduction in turbidity in the same unit from a peak of 1,200 to less than 400. Iron levels brought back down into spec in under two hours compared with four and a half hours pre anodamine. So again, a similar story. Getting on to some of the photos. Um, the, uh, this is a low pressure distribution duct on an ACC on a 750 megawatt supercritical unit. Um, the photos on the, the left were taken during the 2019 outage um, to replace the super, uh, sorry, the uh, reheater at this uh, station. And uh, we found fairly extensive uh, 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 corrosion evident. After 12 months on an Odomen, the picture on the right, um, and we've used the pictures to reference the same positions, and that's why you'll see the, 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 the actual photo on the bottom, um, where you can see extensive repair. Um, the uh, um, significant reduction in the area of um, FAC and, and significantly duller. It's not that shiny, um, aggressive uh, metal. Um, turning vein on the, on the same ACC, and again, we can see fairly extensive damage. Um, and this has been evident in this unit for, uh, uh, for, for many years. I saw a paper presented uh, uh, eight or nine years ago where it was uh, already evident at that stage. But after 12 months, what we're seeing is some very significant changes to the, uh, to the um, corrosion, to the FAC, where we see it going from that silver active to, to grey and dull. And obviously, as uh, Barry pointed out, transitioning to magnetite and hence onto to hematite. So, um, and that's after 12 months. And that's at the end of, 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 the, uh, of the circuit, a very, very big circuit with, a, with an ACC and we're starting to see some good positive results. Okay, um, the catch word these days seems to be flexible operation. Um, base load stations are now being expected to do things they weren't ever designed to do. Um, Short-term outages, um, cycling, and um, so anodamine is active in both steam and liquid phase, so protection right across the cycle, online and offline. So potential for faster return to service, reduction in tube failures. HRSGs are particularly prone to, to this and it's very difficult. Uh, the uh, tube failures generally occur in the hottest area, so you have to cut your way in, uh, repair it and build your way out. So it's not an easy job. Uh, anodamine uh, has demonstrated an ability to reduce DWD uh, to cycle, clear cycle and hence reduce the, uh, the heat buildup that Barry talked about the other day um, with reduced deposit loading. Um, the, the whole uh, situation can be, uh, can be reduced in, in, in severity. Um, potential to avoid acid cleans, uh, uh, chemical cleans. Um, the uh, evidence has been very, very clear um, through the years uh, and Piper has just replicated that. They're not planning to do a chemical clean for the outage on Unit 2 next year. Um, and uh, um, all things are looking good with the uh, return to service of Unit 1. So. There we have it, um, higher availability and reliability, complete offline protection, all leading to improved chance of delivering the new paradigm, optimum flexibility. And uh, thanks for your attention. Yeah, uh, John, uh, thanks um, uh, Thanks very much. Um, I, I, as you know, and you saw with the other um, sponsors, we decided not to have any questions and question and answer after each one, but um, sure. I note that I, I note in your presentation there was a lot of um, th there was a lot of uh, claims, and what we want to do is uh, uh, ask you to come back next year and make a presentation so that we can uh, so that we can ruggedly question 
some of the uh, signs that you're indicating here. So sure. thanks, uh, thanks very much. Thanks, Barry. So, so let's uh, move on to uh, Metla Toledo. Oh, good morning. Uh, I'll just share my screen here. Okay, well, thank you, Barry, um, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Uh, I'd like to um, thank the official steering committee and uh, the fact that we can be a proud sponsor of this year's AB Hub 2021 conference, which is a fantastic information sharing forum. My name is Shane Jordan Hill. I'm the territory manager for our process analytics division of Metla Toledo, based in Melbourne. And I'm just going to briefly give a bit of an overview about. Who is Metla Toledo and uh, our activity in the, particularly in the power sector on a global scale? So, who is Metla Toledo? Metla Toledo is part of the Fortune 500 list of companies on the US stock exchange. We have almost 14,000 employees globally, and we have a presence with uh, 30 in 39 countries around the world. In uh, Australia, our head office is in Melbourne, sunny Melbourne at the moment, uh, and we also have service offices in every capital city, bar Darwin, um, across the country. In New Zealand, uh, we're based in Hamilton on the North Island. So what drives Metla Toledo? Metla Toledo is driven by innovation. Uh, innovation in developing and delivering state-of-the-art instrumentation across our value chain. Uh, we're driven to improve customer workflows, to make results more precise and reliable, to simplify user interaction with the instruments they're using, and to support customers' regulatory needs. Our solutions that we deliver across our value chain, if you take this as a good pick diagram of the areas that we're involved in developing, uh, researching and delivering instrumentation. That certainly is in our laboratory solutions, and I'll just very briefly mention currently our, we have a high-end UV vis technology, and we're currently developing methods with FFP and FFS manufacturers uh, to deliver accurate methods of detection for um, those low-level FFP and FS film forming solutions uh, in the power sector. The process analytics division, which I'm certainly responsible for, uh, this is where we have our applications in the in the power sector to monitor and give you a holistic view of your steam water cycle chemistry. Other big divisions of Metla Toledo globally include our industrial weighing divisions, product inspection, which is huge in the food and beverage markets in Australia, where we deliver X-ray metal detection uh, type equipment, logistic solutions, uh, right up to um, you know, 100 ton uh, way bridges, and we also have technologies for retail weighing solutions as well. So, what markets do the process analytics division fit on a global scale? Well, we certainly have technologies and applications across the chemical and bio and petrochemical sector. Pharma and biotech is very big for the process analytics portfolio, uh, food and beverage, and obviously the power generation sector. That's a a key global market for us um, globally. Microelectronics, not present in Australia, but certainly big in other parts of Asia. At this point, it's also important to note that a lot of the technology that we have developed for the, farm, uh, for the power industry, like uh, conductivity, pH, ORP, TOC, is certainly used across and, uh, and has applications in the pharma and biotech. And uh, now that we're coming to the end of the global pandemic, I guess we're proud to uh, to let you know, there's a bit of a side information that our P uh, TOC uh, technologies and our conductivity technologies and P technologies and optical DO are used in the manufacture of um, 
the vaccines uh, across the world, particularly in Macclesfield in AstraZeneca, and also here at CSL in Melbourne, who are producing the AstraZeneca vaccine. They're using our TOC and conductivity for measuring their pure water loops. So just a bit of a bypass and some, um, I guess, some interesting information of where we are certainly present outside of the power industry as well. So let's focus on power plant water chemistry concerns. And these are concerns across uh, across all the power plants and questions that uh, you ask yourself, can I monitor water chemistry without laboratory tests? Well, yes, we certainly develop solutions for you to do that. How can I reduce costs associated with laboratory testing? How do I achieve more accurate water chemistry measurements? And how do I ensure plant safety and prevent components from corrosion? Why online measurements? Well, in many cases uh, across all industries, online measurements eliminate commonly performed offline measurements. Uh, in the power sector, obviously chloride, sulfate, sodium, silica, in some cases, not so much in Australia, TOC, uh, we can certainly um, offer innovative online technologies for these measurements. Online measurements eliminate expensive laboratory equipment and the need for specialised trained personnel by switching to an online measurement solution. You can certainly achieve higher accuracy by measuring and testing the water directly in the cycle with online instruments. Again, if I refer back to the pharma sector, some of the um, online parameters are actually regulated parameters and have to be measured in the water loop itself. An online measurement obviously gives you a faster response um, and enables you to, to quickly react uh, to problems before they start destroying your assets uh, in, a, in the power plant itself. I won't go through this slide in too much detail. It's, I guess it's preaching to the converted, but power applications and online measurement points. Um, my colleague Kirk, who's uh, in Zurich at the moment, he mentioned level minimum level uh, instrumentation, which is critical for uh, steam cycle uh, monitoring. Uh, and there's also a range of op optional measurement technologies that you can utilize to get a better understanding of your steam water cycle chemistry. And Metla Toledo have produced and developed uh, technologies for specific conductivity, cation conductivity, direct chloride sulfate monitoring, dissolved oxygen, sodium silica. So we have a complete holistic portfolio in order for you to, to um, have 100% confidence in the analytics, uh, which is critical in order for you to protect your assets. Again, combined cycle online measurement points, critical points and not so critical points are identified in this in this flow diagram. So what are the, some of the innovative online measurement solutions which Metla Toledo have developed over the 50 or 60 years that we've been uh, involved in the power sector? More recently, uh, I guess we're encouraged by EPRI uh, to produce a true chloride sulfate measurement technology um, for the power industry specifically, and also encouraged by turbine manufacturers to have a more accurate inline or at line measurement of chloride sulfate. So uh, back in 2017, we launched um, the 3000 CS, which is a direct measurement of chloride sulfate down to low parts per billion level. Uh, we utilize microcapillary electrophoresis technology uh, and it's designed to be uh, installed at line. It's at line as opposed to in line because it's taken a sample from your, your critical sample streams through the instrument and uh, to gravity. TOC technology, not so much utilized, but certainly may have some applications, particularly uh, where your water source is a natural water source uh, with high organics. Um, high organics can uh, can break down to um, uh, organic acids and affect your pH and your water loop. Uh, TOC also can identify if you um, to eliminate the buildup of um, and fouling of resins in your demium plan as well. Obviously, we produce low uh, maintenance sodium and silica measurement technologies as well. So the trace detection of corrosive uh, contaminants. Uh, is obviously critical for you to determine true levels of um, nasty, nasty species like chloride and sulfate. Trace detection of sodium and steam and condensate to control corrosion. 
detect silica carryover uh, in steam, uh, and also to detect early breakthrough of cation anion uh, resin beds. One of our latest developments uh, is our new silica analyzer. We put a lot of uh, research and development money uh, in our Ballerica facility in, in Thornton in the US uh, to improve our silica inline silica analyzer technology. We've also identified too that, that, that um, phosphate is still quite quite um, prevalent in in uh, uh, in a lot of power plants around the world and there wasn't really a, an adequate phosphate analyzer or robust phosphate analyzer on the market. Uh, so we've actually incorporated phosphate measurement into our silica analyzer as well. Uh, the new silica analyzer is a, it's a integrated multi-stream, so you can have up to four streams, which is a full operational sequencer built into the unit itself. Uh, a smaller footprint that's using less reagents, and um, and you can also purchase the units now one, two, or four stream, and with the, the phosphate capacity. Uh, if if you know a little bit about chemistry, the, the ammonia molybdate uh, complex for silica is formed, it, it reacts exactly the same way as phosphate. So we've been able to develop those two technologies into one compact uh, inline analyzer. TOC, I mentioned briefly before, very huge applications in pure water and water for injection in pharma sector. It certainly ha may have applications, um, or certainly does have applications in monitoring of your organic contents uh, in your water cycle chemistry as well. Obviously, conductivity. Conductivity is critical, uh, whether you're measuring specific or you will be measuring specific cation conductivity, um, uh, cation conductivity, direct conductivity. Our technology in, in conductivity goes way back to Dr. Thornton, who developed the first uh, conductivity versus temperature relationship. And, and we have um, very accurate temperature compensated conductivity technology throughout the, the Metla Toledo portfolio. Obviously, the change market uh, uh, due to renewables in uh, around the world, uh, your plants are now cycling. Um, uh, a lot of the older plants have un unplanned shutdowns. Uh, to increase and get a, a plant uh, up faster, quicker, obviously a degas conductivity module, uh, which has been designed uh, for that exact purpose to get you online quicker. Um, so certainly that it's uh, technology which is of more interest in the marketplace these days. Technology and pH and ORP we have a long history since uh, the, Dr. Ingold, uh, about 110 years, years ago, who developed the first uh, compensated uh, combination uh, pH electrode. So I guess Metla Toledo certainly has a complete power analytics portfolio um, designed to give you a holistic view of your uh, steam water cycle chemistry. Uh, and it's critical in order to protect your assets to have 100% confidence uh, in your in your uh, analytical uh, techniques and technology. So um, I'd, again, just like to thank the AB Hug uh, conference organisers for for me to the, give the opportunity to uh, very briefly discuss what Metla Toledo is in uh, in the space on a global level. So thank you very much. Uh, Shane, thank you very much. That was a nice uh, presentation to complement uh, what Kirk gave yesterday. But I think we sh everybody should know what that minimum level of instrumentation is. So we're going to move to the um, we're going to move to the second half, and I'm going to turn over the chair to Bob for this for the second half now. Okay, thank you, Barry. Uh, Douglas Bell, uh, can you? Uh... Get your audio fired up and uh, yeah, hopefully you can hear me. I'll just wait for the share screen ability. Yeah, we hear you. Uh, we hear you fine. Okay. Okay. How's that? Can you see that screen? Looks perfect. Yep. Take it away. Perfect. Okay. Thank, uh, thank you all. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to present today. Uh, there's been lots of great presentations, lots of great information. So hopefully I can add to that today. Our uh, presentation today is on inspection of piping under insulation. Corrosion under insulation is a, or, or internal wall loss as well under insulation is a massive challenge. It's been a long-standing challenge for asset owners, uh, causing costly downtime, close to safety risks, 
uh, loss of containment, and also just uh, a costly asset damage as well ongoing. Typical power plant wall loss, the, the main uh, wall loss mechanisms in power stations or in, in boilers, drain lines, et cetera. Uh, internal pipe erosion, FAC erosion, and corrosion under insulation, which is external damage mechanism. Wall loss measurement techniques. The, uh, there's lots of inspection techniques now uh, have been developed. Today, what I wanna do is just go through some of those. Um, briefly, but uh, concentrate on a couple more in particular, which are less intrusive, uh, including uh, remove, removal of insulation, visual inspection, ultrasonic thickness measurements, infrared testing, neutron backscatter, real-time radiography, guided wave, 3D laser profile, pulse steady current, and profile radiography using DDA. So visual inspection, isn't it just the best way to remove the insulation and inspect the thickness? Uh, Typically, that would be right, but we need to do this offline. Obviously, the pipes are insulated to keep either temperature in the pipe or, or uh, protection from the thermal, uh, thermal risk of the pipe presents. Also, when you remove the insulation, you, you're allowing water or moisture ingress into that insulation under the cladding. So even though this may be a usable method, uh, it does present its challenges with needing to be offline, but also allowing water, water ingress. Infrared testing or thermal thermal camera. What this is doing, this is a, a screening tool to detect possible areas where there would be moisture within the insulation. This can be used to scan large areas of insulated uh, piping or vessels. It doesn't detect if there is corrosion, it just picks up suspect areas where there's water ingress or there's water present and we can look at those further for further in investigation. Neutron backscatter, once again, this is a screening tool to detect moisture within the insulation. It uses very low levels of radiation and it detects moisture within the insulation. One downside of this one is the, moisture, the insulation must be saturated to be able to detect the moisture in there. Once again, once we find that moisture, we need to be able to to investigate those areas further. Real-time radiography, uh, using a C-arm, um, the X-ray detects, uh, the X-ray is pushed through the, uh, the cladding and the real-time detectors on the other side. The operator manipulates the C-arm around the pipe, guiding it to the image of the OD of the pipe. Typical scan will begin by moving the arm to view both top and bottom of the pipe. The C arm is then rotated 90 degrees to scan the area of the pipe. Just some typical examples of real-time radiography. The big, one of the big challenges with real, this, this method is that it's very difficult to detect internal wall. Uh, you can see some scale or some corrosion building on the outside, but very difficult to, deter, to detect any, any issues internal of the pipe. Laser handheld uh, scanning. Uh, once again, this is, a, this is a method, once we've detected any corrosion, we need to strip all the insulation off, all the cladding off, repair the surface, and then we can do a, a, a laser scan to produce a 3D model. Uh, as per the visual inspection, uh, this needs to be done when it's offline uh, and prepare the surface and can be costly and costly in downtime. Guided wave or long range ultrasonics uh, is an application where you can see here the collar will go onto a pipe and it shoots the sound over long distances through the pipe. Uh, the distance can be affected by many, many factors being insulation type, soil bins, nozzles, things like that. But it's a great tool to be able to detect uh, corrosion or wall loss, both internal and external. Uh, in piping and insulation. Once again, one of the down, downsides of this is you will need to remove areas of insulation and cladding to be able to have the probes in direct contact with the material. 
and we also need to prepare that surface so we get good sound transition through. Applications for guided wave, above ground piping racks, corrosion under insulation, contact point corrosion, road crossing, buried piping, furnace tubes, wall penetrations and solar air interfaces. Pulse steady current, uh, CUI inspection on piping above 50 millimetres diameter on vessels and tanks, on piping and vessels and tanks. Insulation can be up to 180 mil thick, material thickness up to 70 mil. HECT is a screen tool that, that can cover surface large areas in a timely manner. It will provide an indicative wall thickness and areas of concern should be followed up with supplementary inspection. It can be used through a variety of insulation and cladding materials, including fireproofing, refractory, SMF, aluminium, stainless steel, and galvanized carbon steel. Pect is suitable for use on live plant. It can be affected by excessive vibrations. As PEC takes a, a footprint of an average wall thickness, it would not be suitable for areas where there's uh, isolated pitting is suspected as a damage mechanism. This is just a little simula simulation of how PEC works. You can see the wall loss there. Four inch insulation. The sound is sent through and, and cover the area and gives us the reading. This is where the importance of, of probe selection using PEC is very important. Because we selected the correct probe, we'd get a smaller footprint, we'd get a more accurate reading of the actual wall loss. And this is just a typical inspection and raw data. This is a um, just opposite uh, an, an inlet on this drain line or this main, main drain line on a power station. And you can see the, the area inspected and just a typical wall loss. You can see able to measure down to 4.1 4 uh, millimetres from a nominal thickness of around the 10, 10.5 millimetres. Digital radiography or digital detector array. Wall loss inspection on piping up to 150 millimetres. Can be used on slightly larger diameters, but the order of accuracy will be affected. Insulation up to 100 millimetres thick for accurate results. Can be used on thicker insulation, but once again, yeah, the order of accuracy will be affected. Material thickness up to 35 millimetres. DDA provides extremely fast exposure compared to conventional radiography. DDA provides immediate results with more precise measurements. DDA is suitable for use on live plant, but can be affected once again by excessive vibrations and movement of the piping. Due to the dynamic range of DDA, Items with variable wall thickness can be inspected accurately. Also through um, pipe supports, brackets, things like that, we can pick up internal uh, wall loss or external wall loss corrosion and measure them quite accurately. Due to the advances of DDA technology or digital radiography and the detectors, the, um, the greater resolution we can get and the sensitivity, other defects such as very small pitting and even cracking can be detected and accurately measured. Uh, the advances in uh, DDA technology or digital uh, radiography now, the, um, the screens now are down to 100 microns, and we're also working with one supplier to have the screens down to 75 microns in resolution, which is a massive change for what was previously around. Just some examples of CUI, which is external corrosion. You can see here using DDA, clearly see external corrosion and the external pitting, able to be measured accurately and passed on in real time to the client. Also, you can see, not so much here, but we're able to, using digital radiography, if there's any moisture content in the insulation, that will show up too as a cloudy, uh, a cloudy detection within the insulation, which is a which is a major challenge as well with CUI with moisture in there. We can notify the client or the asset owners of those as well. Uh, 
As some examples of DDA with internal wall loss. You can see this bend here, which had FAC. Uh, I'm not sure how good this comes up on the screen, but you can clearly see the erosion in that area using DDA, which may be a challenge with other methods, given the, the profile of that wall loss to be able to measure that accurately. And I mentioned before about being able to see wall loss through pipe supports and clamps. You can see this clamp here, and you can clearly see the wall, uh, the internal wall, external wall of the pipe run through the clamp there. So if there's any corrosion or wall loss in that area, we're also able to detect and measure those. And just some other examples of internal wall loss, just general flow erosion through the bends or the exodus of the bends. All these, plant, all these images were taken when the plant was online um, and we can reduce the downtime and continue on with the plant actively and point out some areas where they can uh, put the maintenance plan in place when, when the plant is down on shutdown. CUI inspections via rope access. So the majority of CUI inspections can be performed using rope access. Overall cost of inspection can be reduced by utilising the appropriate inspection technique and rope access. Obviously no scaffolding of ins or insulation removal. This is just a quick overview. Um, this is more for the purpose of later on if people wanted to uh, review the presentation again later, it's just the comments I've made just in a summary. Um, the advantages and the limitations of each method I've spoken about today. One thing I wanted to point out though with um, profile radiography, even though uh, there is a challenge with exclusion zones, um, as we would typically see with radiography. It is certainly um, very well suited for what we call close proximity radiography, where we can certainly reduce the uh, exclusion zones and the barricaded areas down to just a number of metres. And we can do this with, as, um, with a plan online, so it's a less of an impact on, uh, on work in the area and also with um, operations and uh, other, other operations in the area. So just a summary on, on the points today. There are multiple methods able to assist with the detection of wall loss for, for piping, vessels and so forth under insulation. Most inspection techniques were developed and have been used have been in use and well established in the oil and gas petrochemical industries, but can be a very valuable resource in the power industry. Um, we've been getting a lot of inquiries now from the power industry starting to, to want us to adapt some of these techniques over to their more unique problems. Careful consideration must be given on inspection techniques to provide the highest probability of detection for the suspected damage mechanism. We suggest the most relevant techniques for the power industry that we've, we've found in, in recent time is, is PEC and profile radiography to reduce downtime and any additional works such as uh, pipe preparation, uh, linishing pipe, re removing of corrosion, also removing of insulation. Cost saving by the asset owner can be made where these techniques are used correctly without the removal of insulation and where rope access can be, can be advantage. Thank you and questions. I got through that reasonably quickly just because I know typically there's a lot of questions around these methods and things like that. So I wanted to not go over my lot of time, but also make sure that was enough time for questions or, or follow up remarks. Oh, very good. Very good, uh, Douglas. Thank you. I, th th there haven't been any questions submitted yet, but there may be. But I have one while we're waiting. Um, this is a little off the mark for corrosion under installation. But if you were looking at a superheater tube, for example, with the digital uh, radiography, can you distinguish the base metal from the internal oxide growth? The oxide would be a very similar density, um, density makeup of, of, the, of the base metal. So um, without trials, I, I think it, just thinking off 
um, on the question at the moment, uh, it might be very difficult just based on on the density. There's not a lot of density change or uh, between the oxide and the the um, the parent metal. I was certainly able to do some trials to see if that works, but um, I think just just because of the very similar in density, you may not get a change in that structure. Right. I see. Yeah, Doug, Doug, that's the uh, uh, that's the normal answer. The oxides in the superheater are uh, generally considered to be too thin, and we and, and to answer Bob's question, we would usually just use UT uh, from the outside. The, the techniques are pretty well established, as you know. Yeah, they are. The, the ultrasonics is well established now, and there's some very very good methods to measure those oxide layers using um, ultrasonics. Yeah. No, it's yeah. a it's a well established process that we developed uh, uh, many years ago. Um, can I can I ask one, Bob? Yeah, please. Yeah, yeah. I, think I, I, I don't have one on CUI either, but I thought it might be just useful to uh, mention um, all the uh, FAC work that we do. Uh, you know, I've done it for most of the plants in Australia, but you know, two hundred or something around the world. And we usually uh, we usually suggest when we've done the assessment that we would use pulsed eddy current for single phase FAC, and um, it seems to it seems to it seems to work okay. But just because of the of the geometry of where of where two phase FAC takes place, it's not it's not very suitable. Uh, yeah, yes. Yeah, sorry, what, was there a question here, Barry? Or was that no 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 there wasn't I was oh. I, 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 I was just amplifying because you hadn't you hadn't mentioned about uh, uh, the difference between the different types of FAC that can take place yes sorry That's yeah all. yeah and the and the other comment uh, the other comment that I have is um, uh, Anita Zunka asked yesterday about pitting in uh, superheat and reheat tubes. And, yep. uh, and sometimes, uh, sometimes we uh, use guided wave for that. Um, and um, uh, as long as as long as you can have access to fairly long lengths of tube, and uh, the problem is, as you know, you can't tell the difference between the inside and the outside. But if you're looking for pitting, it's pretty clear where it is. Uh, yes, and this the digital um, radiography looking for pitting. Um, yeah, particularly yeah. now with the advancements of the the resolution of the of the detectors now or the the panels now um, can certainly detect very small pitting, very, and able to if even if it's in the profile, not in the profile, but in the plane of the shot, um, we can detect very small changes in wall thickness and able to measure them uh, yeah. with a comparator shim and things like that through grayscale. There's um, there's a change in grayscale across. Um, across the image, and the software enables us to measure that very small change in grayscale and compare it to a comparative shim to see any wall loss. Doug, does so, that get affected by the um, external deposits that could be on the tube? So, yeah. I beg your pardon? Does that get affected by the external um, deposits that may still exist on the tube? Uh, well, because of the typically, if it's corrosion, uh, corrosion has a very um, uh, a, a different um, density to the actual parent material. So, if there's heavy, tight, packed um, corrosion on there, it can affect it. But if it's loose scale, things like that, um, it doesn't so much affect the ability to be able to take the radiograph through there. As long as you know that there, you can consider that in your evaluation. If there's mm -hmm. material such as um, build up refractory or iron deposits, things like that. We may need to look at getting those removed to be able to do the digital radiography through those. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I guess, do you have sort of a, a threshold or, or any sort of guiding um, number that you could advise on what sort of pitting size you'd be able to detect? Like, does it um, need to be, you know, twenty percent wall thickness or, or something along those lines? In the profile, we can detect, detect very small changes in in wall thickness um, with pitting um, around the yeah the ten to 50, the ten to twenty percent would be about the minimum. Anything under that would be very hard to detect a, a change in the the wall loss. But anything under there may not be an issue. 
So anything above the 20%, we can definitely see the pitting. What about if you're using grayscale? Uh, uh, yes, yes, still, we can still measure those very small changes in grayscale. And just um, uh, further to Barry's comment about the guided wave on um, boiler tubes and um, superheater pendant pitting, I guess, what's your experience with that? Is that, um, what sort of threshold of detection do you think you'd have? We haven't had, we've had only very limited stuff. We've had some um, work in the States with our guided wave and in the UK on on smaller diameter tubing looking for pitting. So um, I could follow that up with you, Anita, anyway, and get some more information from that from our, from our guys in the, in the States and um, in the UK. We've done some of the work in Australia, but um, it was more looking for for um, large areas of corrosion on the pipe supports and under insulation. So um, smaller pitting, um, we haven't had so much um, uh, so much work with that, but I know our, our guys in the states have. So I can follow up. Yeah. That'd be great. Thanks. Yeah. To my my experience. Uh, and so you can uh, you can contact um, SI through your association because we've done quite we've done quite a bit of it. Yes, definitely. And uh, and uh, Doug, there's uh, there's one one last question here from uh, Raina Shoyer. Uh, uh, what's the best NDE method for fin tubes? For fin tubes? Fin tubes, you know, like in HRSGs or in economizers or uh, of conventional things. Yeah, that that pres presents a challenge with the fin tubes. So still. With those fin tubes, we're looking at um, potential, uh, um, looking at internal inspections, which would be an iris inspection or an eddy current inspection, or even just a visual inspection on the internals. We need to get access to the internals. But, but there are challenges with those fin tubes, with the, the fins on the external, um, which would be covering up any potential defects, things like that. Yeah, it's very, it's, it's very difficult. Uh, Lester, uh, uh, Lester Stanley has one. Uh, if you can make it quick, Lester, please. Sure. I, I, can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Yep. Um, I just want to make a comment. Um, you know, with HRSG specifically, with all the vent lines and the drum connections. You know, I saw a lot of pictures just now of bigger pipes, but really uh, think about all those vents and drains and. And drum connections and how they connect. You get insulation that touches the roof casing of an HRSG. It's just like a sponge, and then it, it it soaks up the moisture and it attacks those vents. So a lot of those HRSGs in Australia are 15 plus years old. Be thinking about your vents because that's a big liability that's starting to starting to uh, take its toll here in USA. Good. Th uh, thank you for the comment, Lester. Uh, Bob, I think that's uh, all we can move on now, please. Thank you very much, Douglas. Very nice and informative. Uh, Brendan Stevenson, can you uh, get your screen shared and get your AV up for us? Hello. Yeah, Bob, I think we're on uh, Matt Harris right now. Oh, I'm sorry. I jumped. I jumped down. Excuse me. My fault, Matt. Uh, Morning, everyone. Everything I said to you, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> that looking okay? Is it? Yeah, you're looking good. We just need to get the uh, the presentation mode going. There you go. All right, take it away. Cool, thank you. Um, yeah, I guess this is a quick note. I'm looking at my big screen, so trying not to ignore the virtual crowd there. Um, most, I've seen a few names there that would be familiar with who I am. Um, this is my first attendance at a AB Hug conference, so thank you for allowing me to present. Um, yeah, I've been in the power industry well specifically in um, chem labs for about 13 years so i have been floating around i'm not new for those that are like who is this guy um so i guess today what i wanted to present on was a piece of work that occurred um 
in relation to FAC um, at the Bayswater Power Station. I guess just as a bit of a call out, this happened in, I believe it's 2019, so a few years ago. Um, I wasn't um, firsthand involved, but I just wanted to, I guess, share and highlight all the good work um, that, that happened during that period. Um, I guess setting the scene too. So I'm going to go through today what happened, um, what we looked at. I wanted to, I guess, have a focus on FAC management as a topic itself um, and FAC and its importance. So not necessarily delving into, you know, the mechanisms of FAC, but a bit more broader scope as a bit of a, um, a bit of a, I guess, a bit of a um, reminder to all. Um, and I guess linking back you know, all our HRSGs into, into this forum. If you can think about your two phase areas um, and, and, and pH numbers and things. Um, but anyway, so I'll um, get into it. So for the, um, the time period, I'll just run through a brief introduction of the, the units um, and chemistry, a little piece around FAC management, um, a little bit more FAC assessment, um, what we found and reporting, and then I'll, I'll wrap up from there. So I'm sure most of you are familiar with the Bayswater Power Station um, or Macquarie AGLM, which comprises of um, Liddell Power Station as well. Um, specifically Bayswater, we've got four units up there, um, two are 660, two are 285s um, that have undergone some turbine upgrades. We're black coal fired, subcritical natural circ drums um, with the main steam pressure to Shiva turbines at 16 MPA. Um, unit chemistry, I guess one of the more tricky ones of the bunch, we're mixed metallurgy with um, copper-based LP heaters. So therefore we're running an AVTR feed water chemistry program. Um, the boiler chemistry is, is on AVT. Um, condensate feed water pH in the range of nine to 9.3. Um, and I guess there's a bit of a call out here. There's no film forming substance um, added. It's probably going to be a bit more common to discuss that um, going forward. All right, so FAC management, um, it's probably obviously wouldn't be a new topic for most here, um, specifically at Bayswater, given that it is that AVTR plant, um, you know, worldwide, we've seen all the scary photos there. Um, on what can happen if you, that dosing control is not right. So there's a high level of understanding of that FAC risk. Um, there's a highly developed out FAC management plan that's in place, as you would expect. Um, you know, calls out all the appropriate locations. Um, in this case, again, being AVTR, as you'd expect, there was a strong focus on single phase areas. Um, and it, it's specifically tailored to piping from the feed, feed, <laughs> feed pumps to the economizer inlet. And I guess calling out that, um, that temperature range there, which we'll get to in a second. Um, there's a corporate FAC standard to support um, this FAC management plan. Um, as you'd expect, manage for yearly on that major outage cycle um, with visual inspections and NDT program. Um, this is, I guess, supported by monthly grab sample analysis for feed water corrosion products. Um, so just to touch on the plant, there's been no history of significant or unexpected wall loss, so single or two phase. So there's the known knowns. Um, and then there's been no history of FAC failure. So we haven't had any incidents um, either, which is which is good. Um, 
So what I like to call chemistry nuances, so a little bit more of that background of the plant. Um, periods of high condensate dissolved oxygen, um, I guess relative to outside of IAPS guidelines there for periods. Um, again, it's a bit of a problem when you're operating under that AVTR or reducing environment. Um, but so we end up with a bit of a boiler chem clean frequency on that six to eight year period. Um, aging copper base condensers, so have periods of condenser leaks, which are just adding to, um, I guess, that overall chemistry um, struggles there. Uh, IAPS instrumentation levels are not met, so you can appreciate, I'm sure, um, visibility around the cycle and chemistry control is then, I guess, somewhat limited in that space. Um, just to call out the air dissolved oxygen um, sitting in that two to five range, um, deer at an outlet. Um, and then I guess of note as well, those feed water, copper and iron averages are both greater than two. So just to call out that we're operating um, above that IAPS um, guidelines for corrosion product. And as a bit of a reference point, you can see on the page that um, as, as to why some of those, um, some of those issues. So pretty plain story so far. That's a typical plant you'd find across uh, Australia, I would imagine, with mixed metallurgy. So, you know, FAC is being managed well. It's understood. We understand where we're sitting with chemistry. We understand where we're sitting with the plant. So why would you bother assess assessing further? Um, yeah, be pretty comfortable with that, what you're hearing so far. So as we all know, FAC is important. Um, linking back to what Barry spoke about yesterday, it's still one of the top five um, repeat cycle chemistry failures or or um, issues in in plants to, as of today. It's a significant safety issue, um, and it needs ongoing management. So I kind of think and view FAC as a bit of the um, a bit of a giant that doesn't sleep here. Um, yeah, you don't want to turn your back on it. Um, specifically, yeah, I guess what we've seen for the last few days, people calling out this flexible operation. So when I say needs ongoing management, I'm sure we've all got this FAC management plan, but it's I highly um, suggest it's based around full load operation where we understand those temperature profiles um good time to dust off that manual um or the, the plan sorry and, and review running at lower loads i'm not delving into that today but it's just a bit of a call out because that's been a bit of a common theme so um please i kind of recommend uh taking this topic quite seriously so what do we do after that point um, so there was external engagement specifically, Barry Dooley was engaged from, um, structural integrity. So this included a two day site visit. So he flew over, which was great. Um, a key component of this visit was an FAC workshop. So, up, um, upskilling of staff that occurred, which was great. Um, that involved, I guess, uh, all stakeholders at that point wasn't focused on engineering or chemistry, it was everyone and a few of our other sites got involved. Um, as you'd expect, there was a review of the online chemistry data um, and with Barry's time as well, there was a whole holistic assessment of that cycle chemistry program. So looking at instrumentation levels, um, all the analysis results, sampling points, um, it was all taken into consideration. Um, the next component of this assessment, so I guess one of the, the, the key notes being that Barry was able to actually come on site. So while he was there, he could pull out all the plant drawings, um, reviewed those and incorporated that with 
previous condition reports. So I looked at all the historical um, FAC reporting there um, and, and areas um, that have been checked or not checked. Um, a plant walk down occurred. So I guess this is a bit of a key feature and call out here. Um, yeah, while barrier is here, we're top to bottom of that boiler. Um, the feed water plant and looked at all the different type of valves, different type of pipe work, heaters, drains, the whole kit and caboodle. There was an outage happening at the same time. So I got to have a, I guess, have a bit of a look and inspect some of those plant areas as well. Um, so all of these, all of this then led to a report. Um, no surprises there. Um, so the report identified um, areas for cycle chemistry program improvement, um, all the kind of common areas that you'd expect. There was obviously a, a significant kind of call out or component FAC, and I guess of note for myself on review and repeating the um, the report. It wasn't generic, so it wasn't a tick and flick. It wasn't, yes, there is an FAC management plan in place. Cool. Um, it wasn't, in short, you know, it wasn't just make sure there is FAC uh, management plan ongoing and inspect, you know, here's the top five common areas. So the approach that was taken, and I'm sure you might not expect anything less, but that specific tailored um, chemistry knowledge outlaid across then that physical plant walk down that led to call out of um, specific plant areas for further um, yeah visual inspection and some NDT. Um, yeah and, and I guess another key component of that it wasn't it wasn't a call out for 140 different areas to go away and look at there was a very few key areas um, and that was given a priority system as well. So that, that was very helpful for, for us. Um, I'm sure you, you've all seen this once or twice before. Um, so yeah, key call out as I referenced at the start, the existing FAC management plan had primarily kind of focused which makes complete sense to me in that 150 to 200 degree range, which is that kind of post the aerator section um, and that kind of single phase environment. Um, yeah, specifically some of the, the, the nuances that were picked up by Barry for our plant were around the pH level. Um, so given that it's AVTR, we're trying to find that um that point of um corrosion balance or sorry protection balance between having copper components in the system and fac and iron protection so um that was a bit of a, a call out there which will coming up i'll kind of explain into why um yeah so no surprises on what the other physical components were in the plant um, around that temperature profile, DO levels, um, some key features around pipe work geometry, um, different types of valves, orifice plates, what was actually installed. Um, and then obviously another key is understanding that material selection. So what were the call outs of the report? Um, so some new areas for for us as it stands. So um, one of the or a few of the key areas were around the temperator sprays, heated drain lines, um, and some control valves in specific to those areas. So I guess we're talking about drain lines, you know, cascading drain lines, but also drain lines to um, you know whether it's back to condensers or, you know, ton dishes and some of that those smaller pipe works. Um, some of these areas had not been previously identified as a part of the FAC inspection program. So, and specifically it was around some of this two phase um, conditions and areas. And that's just kind of the call out linking back to that 
specific um, pH range that we were operating in. Um, another interesting fact, as it would have it, was that the single phase areas um, or the, the, the feed water system itself was actually operating under oxidizing conditions. So there was visual hematite present throughout, um, just linking back to that periods of higher dissolved oxygen um, and some chemistry control issues. So as a primary focus shifting from, I guess, what you'd expect um, of that kind of AVTR um, magnetite were basically an oxidizing in, in a hematite style environment. Um, so I guess that was definitely a bit of a, a, a point of interest. Um, cool. So after the, after there was that call out, um, the team on site got to work, um, they went out and inspected. What did we find? Um, I guess this is the most interesting point. So one of the call outs, as I mentioned before, was around that two phase environment um, for steam attemperators, um, specifically the D superheater attemperator um, control valve. So that was called out as a two phase priority one area. We went and checked and in one of the valves specifically, there was wall loss down to 1.5 millimeters from 12, pretty significant. Um, this was specifically around, sorry, you can't see me pointing at the screen, but <laughs> around the butt weld into that control valve. Um, that's a pretty common valve for this type of plant. So there was multiple locations um, of that, that valve that were tested, inspected, um, that were pulled out of service. As you can see, the valve sitting there, um, we're on grid mat here. So significant safety concern. It's in a, you know, they're in open walkway areas. There, there's definitely risk to personnel with this. Um, 1.5 mil is a, a pretty scary um, thickness, which, you know, caught just in time. Um, so I'm not too sure the photos I've got here, I do, I'm pretty sure they don't relate to this exact valve. But there was inspection done, the photo on the left hand side was the inlet side to this valve or this type of valve, sorry. So you can see that classic FAC damage mechanism there, that, that rippling, um, that iron being removed and deposited. Um, and then you've got the other kind of classic example on the other side there, where you've got the shiny, shiny metal surface and that um that iron being stripped straight out of that um that location and i believe the yellow stuff's probably a bit of flash rusting there from that bare metal exposure um what about the other areas that were called out um they were all assessed as well and they were deemed acceptable with no fac present so as well as i guess the big highlighted concern here that we picked up um, there was a lot learnt too in understanding the plant specific geometry. Um, a lot was learnt in, I guess, specific to the plant, what areas and geometric features were more conducive or not to FAC. Um, actions and what happened next. So the, yeah, remainder of those um a temperator spray line specifically that set were um inspected and replaced uh linking back there was four units the other three are in service those areas were all barricaded off um on the chance they all operate under the same environment um until there was the ability to replace or inspect um this is a i guess a bit of a generic call out here but um to arrest that fac mechanism where appropriate um replace with materials or metal containing at least greater than one percent chromium um going back and updating the fac management plan now with that learnt experience um there was actually instrument 
instrumentation upgrade underway for that better chemistry control but that's something that we're moving forward towards as well and then look at pulling out and ripping into air and leakage um, program and focus to get that um, oxygen under control cool so conclusions and recommendations here um, your FAC management plan is a must do. There's a fair bit of EPRI guidance available in actually going through the proper process and scoring. Um, it needs to be regularly reviewed, so pull it off the shelf. Um, make sure that chemical teams involve. Um, I probably didn't highlight enough. The, that pH difference and that call out was, was basically what led us down this path. So. You know, the, the chemistry teams are chopping and changing sometimes or, you know, periods of high dissolved oxygen, low dissolved oxygen, pH control issues. They need to be involved. Um, upskilling of staff and training. So everyone today on this call, I guess, um, is a big tick for that, that you're listening in now. Maybe hopefully you get something to, to take back that keep that, um, keep that knowledge base up. Um, Consider these two phase areas as well. Some of this smaller pipe work, some of these smaller drains, you know, we can kind of get overshadowed by the big vessels, the big pipe work, all still important, all still um, potentially in high traffic areas. Um, as I said, replace where appropriate with prone based materials. Um, just to call out the best management plan can only reduce risk to as low as practical can never be zero. So how how comfortable are you with your, I guess, assessment of low? Um, and then I guess my kind of favorite call out is that that fresh eyes approach. Um, in this case, this external review with extremely tailored knowledge was invaluable. There was obviously a, a cost associated with it. Nothing comes for free, but you can see the actual value in handing that back. Well, I hope you can see the value in handing that back. Um, yes, so that's, that's almost me done. As I said at the start, I'm just presenting on this good piece of work that happened. So I guess a, a key acknowledgement would be to Barry Dooley, who, who came out and did that assessment. Um, the engineering team, uh, Scott Taylor, Daniel Woodbury, and I believe Riley Lang as well. As we all know, when you find these things on outages, they can be very contentious topics quite quickly. So there's a lot of hard work um, involved there. Peter George, the station chemist, um, facilitating that assessment and being open. And then Hayden Henderson, who was principal chemist at the time, who I guess facilitated and coordinated the whole thing. So thank you for listening. And uh, yeah, great work by all, but that's it. Thank you, Matt. Very, uh, very nice. Boy, I'm glad you guys caught that uh, that wall thinning on that spray line. Wow. Yeah, it could have been scary. Well, yeah, it was scary, I guess. That makes the hair on the back of my neck stand up when I hear that. <laughs> very close. Yeah. yeah. And, it's fed, uh, and it's fed, Bob, from the highest pressure part of the plant. Yeah. So. Yeah, sorry, I, I forgot to mention that. So, yeah, that, that, that feed that feed into that was it 250 degree post economizer so yeah, so there's uh, bob there's one uh, there's one question from bruce i think it's is it bruce leach do they, do you want to you want to speak bruce or me read out yeah, that's me yeah go ahead ah uh, i was just um I think Matt alluded there's um, copper present in the boiler feed water systems at Bayswater, and you're not alone there. Nearly all the IHI boilers in New South Wales thermal stations have an excess copper problem. But what's the effect of this copper problem on FAC? Uh, well, it's just a bit of a, a call out relative to high dissolved oxygen, linking it back to, I guess, boiler um, deposition. Um, not really calling that out um, as a relationship to FAC. No, well, perhaps Barry might like to elaborate. I mean, well, you know, does copper affect the um, risk of FAC or 
or is it sort of two different mechanisms or? No, uh, Bruce, um, the major, the major item is that when you have a mixed metallurgy system, like you have at, uh, at this plant, it means that that, uh, you have to take that balance between, uh, protecting the ferrous parts and protecting the copper parts. So you have to take, and so. We knew when we did the research, maybe 20, 30 years ago, that we had to take a balance and, uh, and, and actually, uh, this plant operates in the, in the correct, uh, approximately the correct uh, mode, you know, 9.1 to 9.3 is okay to protect the copper. It's not quite good enough to protect the, the, uh, the old, the old ferrous part though. So, the, the, so that's the main, uh, so that's the main, uh, uh, in influence of having copper in the cycle, the copper, the copper itself doesn't have any, any basic effect on the FAC mechanism. Yeah, and, and that's why I guess in the actions, you know, we, we were talking about a two phase mechanism there. We couldn't just go and bump the pH up, um, you know, to, uh, to try and help as well. So that, yeah, that we, we've got our hands tied in, in that respect. Um, and I guess it's a bit of a longer term approach. This wasn't a call out from the report that we would be looking at that kind of film forming, um, going down that film forming substance path as well to try and support that um, mixed metallurgy there. And FAC, sorry. Yeah, good. Right. Thanks very much. Yeah. Thanks, uh, Bruce. And uh, I was I, I was just going to make a, a comment, not really a question. And uh, I'm not I'm not actually sure whether the date is correct, but we plan to have an FAC uh, workshop, a virtual workshop, um, uh, as a, as a coordinated effort between um, Australian IAPS and New Zealand IAPS. And um, as I understood the latest date, uh, if David Allison is still on the on the line, he can tell us. But I think it was the 15th of December. Or maybe, or maybe Matt knows. Uh, but if anybody wants any information, you can contact Matt or Hayden Henderson, who's the chair of the OSAPS, and uh, or and or David Addison. Yeah, I just I'm I'm here now, Barry. Um, you know, we're still just uh, working through the planning phase on that. That date might may move. It's uh, everybody's busier than they than they need to be these days, but. That is definitely on the cards, um, whether it's December or early in the new year, we, we intend to have a good little workshop um, session and, and make sure that the um, people have the opportunity to ensure they're up with the, with the latest science and, and the latest practices there. Good. Good. There's, there's no more, there isn't any more questions, Bob. I think you can move on. All right, thank you. Uh, Daniel Blanks, you want to... Uh... Get your screen up and uh, get your audio visual going, and we'll get you started a couple of minutes early. And see that okay? Uh, no, not yet. No. All right, there we go. There you go. Perfect. Cool. Um, so yeah. Thanks for, for having me today. Um, like Matt, this is my first AB Hub conference as well. But um, yeah, I'm not really new to the industry. I've been kind of working through consulting in the power industry for about 10 years now. Um, and I've been with my current company, Quest Integrity, for nearly seven. Um, so yeah, sorry, my name's Daniel Blanks. I'm a senior structural integrity engineer at Quest Integrity based um, on the Gold Coast in Australia. So Today's presentation is just going to cover some case studies and uh, methodologies and observations that we've found from conducting a number of different uh, FEA and creep fatigue crack growth assessments on headers subject to flexible operations. So, you know, it's very topical at the moment, especially in Australia with flexible operations. Um, so we've carried out a number of different studies for different power stations on the effects of different flexible modes. So typically looking at a two shifting or cycling and low loads of low load modes of operation as opposed to regular base load operations. So you know throughout these studies we've looked at different components, um, 
turbines, valves, uh, one of the key components being headers. And so this, this presentation focuses on headers because it's been one of the key components that, that we've looked at. So for each header, we've done detailed finite element analysis, looking at the, the different operating conditions present during each mode. So obviously between base load and two shifting and low load, they undergo different different operation conditions and that drives different stresses, which can lead to creep fatigue, crack growth. So as a means of comparing the severity of these different modes, we've done remaining life assessment based on creep fatigue, crack growth of an initial ligament crack. So assuming there's a small crack there and, and what's the life of that crack to failure based on base load, two shifting, or low load. Um, so yeah, there's, there's been a number of presentations on this during AB Hub on moving towards flexible operations because of the influx of, of solar and other renewables during the day. And, you know, when you start shifting away from baseload operation to flexible operations, you can increase damage to your plant components, in particular thick walled boiler components. But due to the increased transient stresses, thermal fatigue that can occur there. So the two main operational modes that are being looked at are, is two shifting and low load. So two shifting is when the plant starts and stops and really each day runs overnight and stops during the day when the load comes in from renewables and then starts up in the evening. And low load is similar, but rather than shutting down, it just drops to a lower load than typically below design minimums um, when the demand is low there as well for the coal-fired power. So you know, one of the most at-risk components when you're changing the flex operations is, is headers. You know, they're typically very thick, 80 millimetres to 150 millimetres. Um, so the tube holes, configuration of the tubes, you end up with these small ligaments. Uh, and then the high thermal gradients that result from these transient operations can lead to often circumferential ligament cracking. So the, the figure on the right there just shows some results from a scan we did on a, on a header. Um, and the gray is the, the outline of the, the ligament cracking that was measured. So quite extensive cracking, quite deep there um, in this thick walled header component. So just the, the risks that flexible operations pose to headers. So during base load conditions where you've effectively got steady state operating conditions, you've got constant pressure, constant temperature, the, the real main damage mechanism is creep, creep fatigue, crack growth. You've typically got very low cycling, you know, maybe one or two events per year. So fatigue is not a, a big component of that. Whereas when you change to two shifting mode, You've got very frequent fatigue cycling, daily events, and it's starting up and shutting down, and that can lead to significant fatigue damage accumulation and then fatigue crack growth. With low load operation, you've also got daily transient events, but because you're not shutting down, you're just changing to a low load. So there's typically less fatigue coming from that, but the, the risk that often comes with low load is because you're running below the design minimum, you've got unstable firing conditions, you can get fluctuating tube temperatures or higher tube temperatures, and it's typically seen during base load, so you can get an increase in creep that or fatigue if it's fluctuating there as well. So just the, the scope of all the studies was very similar across the headers and components. Looking at creep fatigue, crack growth under a nominal base load mode of operation and comparing that to the growth from the shifting and low load mode of operation. So, throughout the last couple of years, we've looked at different headers for different power stations. Um, so, platinum superheater outlet headers, secondary two superheater outlet headers, tertiary superheater outlet headers, and second stage reheater outlet headers are some of the main ones that we've done. And this has covered a range of different modeling techniques, um, looking at global effects, such as in the top right. The elements 
and seeing how that affects stresses and, and strains in various areas. Um, looking at actually incorporating cracks into the finite element analysis to, to validate uh, fracture mechanics assumptions like on the left. But typically the assessments we've done have been local models like the bottom three here, where you're just looking at one, one element and the tube ligaments there and, and using that to, to gain an understanding of the detailed stresses and stress ranges at those ligaments for assessment. So the technical approach for, for evaluating the remaining life of these headed tube ligaments involved a few different steps. So the first step is doing the heat transfer analysis. So during each event that occurs during an operating mode, so that might be a cold start, hot start, or you know, a, sh a shift to a low load, working out you know, what's the through thickness, temperature distribution of the ligaments during each of those events. So that a transient time-based mechanism. And then for each of those events, using the thermal results from heat transfer analysis to determine the stresses for the stresses and the stress ranges for that. And then also looking at the, the mechanical loading conditions as well. So you know, what are the stresses from internal pressure? Um, and then understanding the cyclic stresses and the primary stresses there, evaluating the creep or the crack growth due to fatigue and then crack growth to creep. And finally, growing an initial crack through that combined creep fatigue crack growth mechanism until failure is reached. So that's either fracture, so based on a failure assessment diagram, or until the crack reaches a depth where uh, a, a leak might occur. And that's also obviously not tolerable. So failure is either a fracture or a leak here. So based on stress results that we've seen through various analysis and also from inspection results, the, the postulated crack used as, as the most likely situation is this full width ligament tube crack. So, you know, in, in most of the components looked at, there's pat ligament full width ligament cracks there, but there might be initial cracking at the tube holes and through growth, those would join until a full width tube crack is, is achieved. So it's quite conservative to start using a, a full width tube ligament crack, but the, the aim of this, these assessments isn't as much as determining the exact remaining life, but to just have a, a comparison between the different modes of operation. So, you know, all three base load, two shift and low load started off with this same initial crack configuration. Um, so, you know, each, each mode of operation has different transient thermal events that, that occur during during that operation. So it's cold starts, warm starts, hot starts and shutdowns. So they occur during base load, they occur during two shift, they occur during low load. So these are each header is is a model for each of these events is uh, their contribution to to the fatigue crack growth uh, needs to be included. So the graph on the screen just shows an example a shutdown event for a secondary to superheater outlet header. Just showing how the, uh, the tube temperatures and the steam temperatures drop over time. So this, this is uh, imported to the model and then we run that through and, and determine the stress range and as a result of this. So as well as those other events, the two shift mode also includes the hot bank where the plant is shut down during the day, but the aim is to retain heat and pressure and then starting. So, uh, just looking at this graph, this is some, some thermocouple and pressure and output results from a hot bank trial event that was carried out. So the, the red line is the, steam, the outlet steam temperature. So the, the hot bank kind of starts around here and you can see that steam temperature is, is maintained fairly well throughout the event um, until the plant starts up again where cold steam enters through um, and then you go back to normal temperature. But one of the important things here is that the actual tube temperatures, which is the purple line, follows a very different trend and does drop off quite quickly um, until it reaches kind of 
steady-ish state temperature here, and then it starts up again quickly too. Um, so that, you know, since we're looking at the, the tube ligaments, this has a, a large impact on the stresses from that. It's this quick drop and, and you know, an overall kind of 200 degree drop in temperature that the tube sees there. Um, so low load obviously doesn't have the hot bank, but it has a, a daily load change event where you're going from kind of base load operation to 100 megawatts or 70 megawatts or something like that. Um, so this is a, a plot for a 70 megawatt load change trial event that was carried out. Um, so the steam temperature in this one is the blue line. So that, that stays relatively constant throughout the load change. It increases a little bit, but of interest is the red line, which is the tube metal temperature, which during the during the load change, when you're running it at a lower output, it actually increases by quite a bit, 40 degrees over nominal. Um, and there's also some, some cycling there as well. So you know, even though there's not a large transient event occurring, you're, you have an increase in this local temperature at the tubes, which can drive an increase in creep and creep um, that growth there as well. So yeah, the first stage of conducting these assessments is to do the heat transfer analysis of each of these events. So cold start, shut downs, hot banking and low loads. Um, so the inputs to that come from a variety of sources. So you might have oxide tube temperature measurements taken across, across the header, um, individual tube and heater thermocouples, steam temperature data. So all of that comes into the model and that's used to, to initially calibrate heat transfer coefficients uh, present where you're looking at the location. So just on the right is an example of one of the more complicated headers that Titan superheat outlet header where you've got a large number of tubes and each of those has different temperatures going in coming from oxide data. Um, and then that is then used to drive the, the calibration to determine the, the film coefficients internally and externally. Um, so starting off the calibration, it, the, the simplest step, which is steady state, where you, you have a lot of data if you know oxide tube temperatures so on the left here this is a plot of um, tube temperatures across the elements of a tertiary superheater outlet header um, for all 10 tubes it just follows a typical m-shaped pattern and so um, knowing where we have header thermocouples we can take the relevant element tube temperatures and put them into this model with the steam temperature uh, and then use that to calibrate kind of steam conditions at steady state, external steam, um, film coefficients as well, which is relatively constant. Um, so this is a, a calibration model that's built where you have header thermocouples that you can make use of those and start calibrating these heat transfer coefficients. Once so you've got that done, then the next step is to uh, calibrate for heat transfer conditions during these transient events. So this is just an example of calibrating through a hot bank event. Um, the graph just shows the red line, which is header temperature. Uh, so that's taken from a thermocouple on the bottom of the header near these tubes. And that's what we're targeting in the FEA. So the dashed black line is the temperature that's output from the FEA. Um, this obviously shows the calibrated model, but throughout stages of this with tweaking steam coefficients until we reach a, a good match like that um, with the inputs being the steam temperature and the tube temperatures. So once we have that those calibrated conditions then we can use that to assess other areas of the, the header um, which uh, defined as kind of the life governing areas. So you know reviewing we might have and looking for generally the hottest tubes which can be the worst because during the hot bank and, and these shifting conditions they have the, the furthest to drop so introducing the lightest um, thermal gradients um, so this here just shows an example of then the actual heat transfer analysis of, of the hot bank event at um, a different element so You've got the, the red line and the purple line, which is the steam temperature and the tube metal temperature. 
and then you've got the dashed green line, which is the, the ID ligament temperature, and the, the dashed blue line, which is the OD ligament temperature. And the, the generation of stress comes from the, the difference between those two. So we have a thermal gradient through that thickness. And so you can see during the duration of the hot bank, the uh, thermal gradient is increasing and that, that drives stress later on when we do the stress analysis. So, yeah, moving on to the stress analysis, the, uh, it, then working out you know, what is the what is the stress developed during those transient thermal events and due to, to mechanical loading as well. Um, so these plots are just a pressure superheat outlet header with a, a unit internal pressure applied. So you know, rather than having to go and work out the mechanical stresses um, for each of the different pressures that might be present during the um, during the events, we can just work it out for a unit unit pressure and then scale that accordingly um, to reflect the actual in service condition for those events. And for each of the transient events, so running through a full transient stress analysis based on those thermal results. Um, so here again is another example of a, a tertiary super outlet header hot bank analysis. So at the top here is those thermal results presented previously, and the bottom is the, in green the ligament ID stress, and in blue the ligament OD stress. So you can see that during hot bank event, we're developing quite significant uh, ID stress tensile, and then uh, when it ramps up again, it, it flips to compressive. Um, and so, you know, you end up having this quite large stress range that then drives fatigue cracking during, you know, that's happening daily. So you're getting this large cyclic stress happening daily from the hot bank. Um, just a plot looking at that peak condition, um, what the stress looks like. So over here on the left is the crack normal stress at the peak and so ligament ID. So you it looks very similar to the crack. Have these high stresses, the corners um, where the cracks might initiate and then join into this full width lip. On the right is the stresses looks a bit different for the load change event. So for the low load, um, we have a bit of a different stress distribution, but of much lower magnitude. I guess is one of the uh, important things to note there. Um, so this is just the plot of some transient stresses extracted from a platinum superheater outlet header, two shift on the left and load change on the right. Um, so looking at the, the ligament ID and the ligament OD stress, so that we have a difference there that's introducing bending stress as well, which can further contribute to the crack growth. But um, and one of the important things to note from this slide is just looking at the magnitude of the stresses. So during the two shift, we have quite high uh, tensile stresses on the internal surface here up to 75, 70 MPA, and a, a large stress range as well between um, peak tensile and the peak compressive. Whereas on the uh, load change during the, the low load event, it's, it's the magnitude of the stresses is not that high, but you have a, an increase in cycling. So for, for the two shift, you know, there's only really one major cycle, maybe another minor one there, but for the, the, the low change for the, the low load, there's you know, a number of different cycles, um, not as large as magnitude as the two shift, but there's more cycles there and there, often at a higher temperature as well. Um, this is just a, a plot showing some of the crack normal stresses on a different header. This is the platinum superheater outlet header from the previous slide, um, showing differences in, in ligament stresses here going around the header um, for the hot bank and the load change as well. Um, yeah, still, you know, the head has changed, but it's very typical stress distribution of the, the ligaments with the peak stresses at that corner stress concentration and extending across the ligament. Um, so another example plot of, of stresses during the two events, so hot bank on the left and load change on the right. Um, 
very similar story to before where for the hot soil stresses in a very large stress range, um, but only really you know, one main cycle, whereas for the load change, you have less significant stresses and you know, even here for the ligament ID, it's not overly tensile either. There's a, a small tensile region at the end, but there is an increase in cycling there. Daniel, uh, excuse me, you've got like five minutes or so. Oh, yep. Um, just some more plots here showing crack normal stresses. So yeah, so I'll speed up a little bit. So the, once we've got those stress histories, then we, we move through each of the transient events and, and rainflow cycle count the stresses. That's then uh, broken down into the relevant cyclic stresses for the fatigue crack rate calculation. So you know, on the left, this is the, the main cycle going from the maximum here to the minimum here, pulling out a three thickness stress distribution and fitting that to a polynomial stress distribution for use in the, the fraction mechanics model. Um, so that's shown here, and then doing that for each of the different cycles. So here, there's 10 cycles, obviously get quite small, but they're all pulled out and input into the fatigue crack growth. Um, likewise, with the mechanical stresses, extracting polynomial stress distributions there for the different events. Um, they're looking at creep effective pressures for the steady state, hot bank and load change uh, through that ligament. So you know, as talked about, we're using a full width tube ligament crack. So that's, that's characterized as an infinitely long surface crack in a plate. Um, and we're starting at a crack depth of three millimeters. That's the conservative initial sizing kind of based on inspection detectability capabilities of a, of a unit. Um, so going through and then taking the stresses that we know for each of the events and on the left here, just shows the different kind of conditions for this load, which is 24 hours of creep at 550 degrees, nearly 17 MPA. Whereas for two shifting, you've got 16 hours at base load and eight hours at the, the lower creep effective temperature with the lower pressure. And similar for a, it, that's factored into the creep calculation. And then on the right is the, the fatigue where for base load, two shifting and low load, you've got one cold start per year, two warm starts per year, and then a different number of, of two shifts and load changes per year. So those are all computed incrementally for each of the events to, to grow this crack. Um, so yeah, starting at the initial size, they've grown through creep fatigue until we either reach failure or a leak. Um, Crip the crack growth on the left for base load conditions for platinum superheat outlet header. So you can see over the 30 years of operation, it only grows a mil and a half, so not significant. Two shifting, the, the crack growth is still relatively slow, last 27.9 years, but you do see a very significant crack. Shifting uh, low load, sorry, doesn't have quite the same amount of crack growth, but there is still an elevated crack growth over base load there. Um, so, you know, the next step was to compare all three of those results, um, which is done here. So, this is plotting those same results for the platinum superheat outlet header um, on the same graph. And you can see that two shifting is, is by far the worst in terms of creep fatigue crack growth and uh, low load. There's an increased crypto D crack growth over base load, but still not that significant. But I guess something to note for those different modes is that base load is it's two shifting, there's a significant fatigue component. Um, and low load has a little bit of a fatigue component, but still predominantly creep there. Just to, to wrap things up. Um, some observations. So for all the headers that we've looked at during the flexible operation study, two shift has resulted in the fastest crack, fatigue, crack growth life because um, it is dominated by fatigue there, resulting in remaining lives. Um, you know, not that much creep fatigue crack growth. And low load generally promoted faster creep fatigue crack growth, um, either due to increased cycling or higher temperatures. Um, 
and across all the headers, base load operation was was very benign. It's limited creep component there, and, and hardly any fatigue component. Um, so yeah, using this combined FEA and creep fatigue track growth can give you an understanding of, of what effects different operational modes might have on your header components um, during remaining life of a crack. And that for some components, typically these these thick core headers to shifting can be very damaging with, with rapid creep fatigue crack growth. Um, and that, that's the final conclusion is that if you are transitioning to flexible operations, having a wide thermocouple coverage and, and an adequate testing of these transient modes is essential to build a valid model. So the, the calibration and then the ongoing the transfer analyses. Um, and then, you know, once you have these models built up, they can be used to conduct studies into ramp up and ramp down rates. So if you're moving to a particular flex operations mode, and then if you do find any defects, you can use them to quickly assess those for fitness of service because you have the model there, you've got the crack fatigue um, set up, you can just change the initial crack size or change the crack configuration to, to what you've inspected in site. Um, yeah, so sorry if that went a little bit over time there. That's just, about, uh, just, just about right, um, Daniel. That's good. You're you're one minute over. Oh, right. It's not too bad <laughs> with all that. <laughs> there's, uh, uh, Bob, there's, there's, there's one question from Evan Olmberg. We'll have that, and then, and then let's go to the sponsor for presentation. Evan, are you, are you still here? Uh, uh, yes, I am. Uh, go, Daniel, yeah, my go. question is, um, I, and I understand a lot of that analysis was for uh, conventional coal boilers, uh, but in HRSGs, it's quite common to see. Uh, potentially a grade 22 header on the inlet side of a panel uh, with a utilization of a T91 tube. And I'm wondering if the dissimilar metal weld at the interface between the grade 22 and the grade 91 header would uh, experience additional stress. And if that would be, you know, is that, is that something that you've seen before? And if that uh, could create an area of higher concern Not something that I've I've looked into. I don't have all that much experience with HRSGs personally. Um, others others in the company do, but yeah, I think that could be an area of concern there, um, especially dissimilar metal welds, um, different thermal properties, things like that. So, yeah, that's something that I would be looking into. All right, great. Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, Brendan Stevens, you want to uh, get your yeah, go ahead. Get set up, and we'll have the uh, final vendor uh, presentation for the evening or the morning for you guys. Sorry. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, you look good. Thank, thanks very much for the opportunity to um, to present at the conference. Um, so my name is um, uh, Brendan Stevenson from um, Energy Plant Solutions, uh, based here in, in New Zealand. Uh, so just a little bit about um, Energy Plant Solutions. Um, the company was formed in two thousand and six. We, we specialise in industrial boiler plant and, and the energy plant, um, admittedly much smaller than um, the majority of the boiler plant that uh, has been referred to um, throughout the conference. Uh, servicing energy plants throughout New Zealand, uh, specialised in valve servicing as well, we have our own valve uh, servicing facility here. Um, we're based in, in Palmerston North, which is in the lower um, half of the uh, North Island of New Zealand. Uh, so we do a lot of uh, design build boiler projects, um, more than 200 megawatt installed within the last 11 years. Uh, offer new gas and all fired boiler plant, um, and we partner with a company in China called Tough Boiler. Uh, we also offer biomass fired boiler plant, um, and we've partnered with a company in Austria called uh, Polytechnic Biomass Energy. 
Uh, we've uh, designed and installed a hydrogen fired boiler plant um, here in New Zealand. And the guys we work with up at Tough Boiler have a, um, a patented uh, hydrogen uh, boiler design. Uh, clean steam generators and geothermal reboilers. Uh, this is something we've, uh, we've um, started getting into of late. Um, obviously, New Zealand has um, you know a, a fair amount of uh, geothermal energy available. Uh, so um, one of the units we've installed of late uh, took geothermal steam and um, used that to generate clean steam for a dairy factory. High voltage electrode boilers is something that we've been getting into over the last three years. Um, we've installed two of those in New Zealand now, um, and we've partnered with uh, Tough Boiler again out of China. Uh, resistive element steam boilers. Uh, this is something that we're just starting to get into, and we're currently developing our own range of resistive element steam boilers up to three megawatt. Pipework design and manufacture. Uh, this is something we do a lot of here in New Zealand, um, and it sits alongside our package boiler um, range that we offer. Heat exchangers, economizers, and uh, condensing economizers. Uh, this is something we've been doing a lot of over the, um, the last sort of ten years, and um, and we manufacture those in house. So our company focus is efficiency, quality, and innovation. Uh, we work for a broad range of people here in New Zealand, lots of industries, a um, lot in the dairy industry, do a lot of work in the timber industry, uh, pharmaceutical, um, small goods, uh, petrochemical. Uh, this was uh, one of the um, First boilers we um, installed. It's a small package boiler. It's the smallest boiler we've installed to date. Uh, this is a hydrogen fired boiler plant that we developed for a um, a, a company in um, in Christchurch of New Zealand that manufactures um, adhesive. Um, we used a uh, waste gas stream out of uh, their factory um, and used that as uh, fuel to uh, fire their boiler plant. So their um, their entire process steam load is now generated using um, this waste gas stream off their uh, manufacturing um, process. Um, we entered and won the um, Energy Efficiency Awards, uh, ECA Awards in 2014 for that project. Uh, this was a job we completed in um, Belclutha, which is in the bottom half of the South Island. Um, it was a greenfield dairy factory back in, in 2012. Um, very short lead time on this particular job, seven months from order to completion of commissioning. Uh, we installed a condensing economizer on this particular boiler plant as well. Um, stack temperatures are down around 50 degrees C. Uh, this was a project we completed for another uh, dairy factory, um, 32 megawatt boiler running at uh, 40 bar saturated steam. Um, yeah, supplying um, high pressure steam to a, a spray dryer. Um, oh, that's just uh, the, the pumps and the uh, stack. As part of the project, we installed a 50 meter stack and that has uh, 63 uh, megawatt of energy um, ducted into that. At, at various heights. This is a product we designed um, and have developed. Uh, it's a package boiler, fire tube shell boiler with a um, economizer and condensing economizer uh, built into the into the top of the boiler plant. Um, we've got a, a number of these running throughout New Zealand. Um, stack temperatures as low as 40 degrees C. Uh, a couple of examples of these particular boiler plants, these two are, two, are 10 megawatt units. Uh, these are just a few slides of some of the biomass fired uh, plants we've been doing. We're up to 14 here in New Zealand now, um, basically taking um, wood residues um, from the forest or sawmills and um, either chipping or hogging those residues and then using that as uh, fuel in a um, specialised uh, biomass fired furnace. Uh, this is one of those examples. It's the um, uh, Burwood Hospital 
uh, in Christchurch. Uh, so there's uh, three boiler plants in there, two biomass fired boilers and a uh, backup diesel fired boiler, which is kept hot by the two biomass fired boilers just for emergency steam supply. Uh, we've since uh, started the Christchurch Hospital Energy Centre, uh, which is uh, much bigger than that. Um, two seven and a half megawatt boilers there, biomass fired boilers, and one eight megawatt backup boiler. Uh, that's the Burwood Hospital when it was finished. Uh, finished that in 2016. Uh, these are just a few more examples of some of the biomass fired boiler plants we've been doing. Um, this particular one here is in a, in a sawmill, and this one here is in a sawmill uh, in the bottom of the South Island. Um, it's a 7 megawatt uh, high temperature hot water boiler running at um, 170 degrees C. Another example of a uh, 10 megawatt package boiler that we've uh, installed. Uh, this one was in a, in a byproducts rendering plant. And these are just a few examples of some of the electrode boilers we've been doing. So these are, are running on 11 kV. Um, this particular unit here is a 12 uh, megawatt unit. Uh, this is one of our um, clean steam generators uh, using geothermal steam. So this particular unit here was uh, running a, um, a dairy factory in the in the central North Island. So they, they don't need any other uh, form of energy other than using the geothermal steam and then putting it through a, um, a reboiler and generating clean steam on the secondary side of that unit for uh, use in their production facility. Uh, this is another one of our uh, electrode boilers. This one's installed right in the bottom of the South Island, uh, just out of Invercargill, uh, 13 megawatt unit. So this is generating um, 10 bar saturated steam uh, to support the steam load for a uh, site that has um, three uh, spray dryers for uh, manufacturing milk powder. Uh, just a few shots here from our um, production facility. So we, we have a lot of uh, automated um, welding equipment. Uh, for, we do a lot of pipe work, so a hot wire TIG in this um, case here. Uh, so that, that's just an example of what we can turn out in about four or five days um, using um, one of these machines that's 10-inch uh, that's pipe there in the foreground. Uh, and these are some of our orbital welding heads that we have. Um, that's a 10-inch pipe there, um, welded in position. Uh, use these on site, uh, quite good, um, you know, where we don't have um, no, no requirement for MMA, so no splatter, um, very safe. These are just a few shots of our uh, valve uh, servicing facility uh, here in Palmerston North. Um, we're constantly doing annual surveys on these boilers and, and valve reconditioning, and we actually manufacture a lot of replacement components for valves. Uh, some of these valves can be quite old and parts are no longer available, so we, we manufacture, um, when required, the replacement components. So that's it for me, just a brief overview of what we do. Um, yeah, and thanks again for having me. Thank you, Brennan. With us, Bob. There's one. Uh, there's one question for Brendan. Okay. From Saravan. Saravan Gray. Sure. Hi, hey, hey Brendan. Uh, uh, what sort of damage mechanisms have you uh, come across in hydrogen fired boilers? Uh, it's really interesting because we are also looking at uh, starting. A conversion to hydrogen firing. Cool. So you're talking about hydrogen on the fire side of the boiler plant? Uh, yeah, so currently we have got coal fired boilers and we are in the initial stages of uh, discussion to start maybe 10% blending uh, of the hydrogen and eventually at some stage go to a hydrogen fired boilers. These are just in the initial stages. Sure, sure. So um, we've we've had uh, the particular plant that we've installed running now for over eight years, and we're not seeing any fire side issues. Um, admittedly, that um, particular plant is running on what they call uh, tail gas, 
which is only around 19% hydrogen and the balance is nitrogen, the balance is inert. Um, so the boiler itself is quite large for the output because it needs to cope with the um, high volume of um, inert gas. Uh, yeah, but we're, we're not seeing any damage in that boiler plant to date on the fire side. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. That's good. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Brendan. Uh, Bob, there's, there was one question for Daniel uh, from Yun Tian, if he's still here. Yeah, thanks, Barry. Um, yeah, just a quick question to Daniel. Um, just wondering if Chris uh, uh, in Chigriti has any um, online monitoring or real time stress to me life calculation. Um, because what I can see is the plant operation team is more interested in real time calculation or monitor of the stress. And I um, understand that the yeah, offline and online um, calculation may be very different in terms of the uh, measurement and also in terms of the uh, calculation of the load cycles. Yeah, so that's, we don't have any commercially available products to offer that, but it's more of a bespoke offering that, um, that we would work with the particular plant in developing. Um, it would you know, be a, a little bit of a different um, methodology than this, where it was based on the remaining life of a, a crack that was present. Um, it would be based on either, if you know you have a crack there, then based on the creep fatigue crack growth of that particular floor, or if you didn't have any cracks, then it would be rather based on a pre fatigue crack initiation style assessment, so determining damage from each event and a damage accumulation style assessment rather than in this approach. All right, thanks. Thank you. Uh, well, we've arrived at adjournment time. Barry, do you have anything in, in, uh, in addition? I don't have any any more questions. I think we just have to. Uh, we're almost exactly on time. You you did a much better job than I did yesterday, and uh, we just have to thank uh, thank uh, all the presenters. I think for all the fourteen uh, for excellent uh, for excellent presentations and keeping on time, and for all the sponsors. Uh, this was something new that we tried out uh, for for this. And I think it was, um, I think it was a good uh, exercise to introduce many of these uh, companies to, to the uh, large number of people that were were here. And yeah. so, um, as as I mentioned before, we're going to um, have the next meeting hopefully live. We have the booking for that in November next year, and uh, we'll be very interested to receive um, suggestions. Uh, uh, what we typically like to do at uh, Abhog is uh, to um, to have some follow up uh, uh, on any of the applications. We had uh, six uh, planned uh, applications this time, and it'd be good to have some updates next year, um, so so that we can uh, follow up. And they don't need to be uh, half hour presentations; they can be ten minute, just a quick uh, up update. And we covered most of the uh, we covered most of the mechanisms and, and a lot of the new things that are taking place. So, I think um, Bob, I think that's all we have to say. Um, and uh, we'll just thank everybody. If there's anybody else that you think that we should mention, please please go ahead. Yeah. Well, let's uh, thank Scott and uh, and the ladies who have who have disappeared on us again. Here, they they're not real. Uh, Sort of bashful. I think they. Uh, I think they've been with us. Uh, that's uh, Heather and uh, Rachel. They've done an excellent job as they do for the live meetings. And thanks to them and to Scott for running okay. the and, WebEx. Uh, for and us. not, not least, thanks for all of the attendees that uh, that signed up and and joined us for the discussions and the uh, presentation.